Well, thank you, Morgan. Thank you, team, for uh, leading us in worship this morning. Morning, church. How are you guys doing today? Good. A little sweaty. It's okay. Me too. Um, I've been sweating since 6.30 this morning, so hey. Um, but man, I am so grateful for today. I actually uh, I love that song uh, that we just finished with, um, but I wanted to start today with kind of a my own arrangement of that song that I have. Um, it goes like this. It says, I'm no longer a slave to England. It just kind of stops there. Um, so it's a favorite of mine. I just, you know, the, the Lord spoke through me this morning and uh, came to my mind. So Mark, I hope you're here and listening. Um, no, uh, man, it is it's silly and it's who I am. <laughs> um, man, today's going to be a great day, except for the heat. hate the heat. Um, but man, I am excited. And I want to kind of first acknowledge today that in a couple of days, we are going to be able to celebrate uh, the 4th of July and celebrate our freedom as a country. And that's a beautiful thing that we get to do. The fact that we are even here and able to do this without fear of any kind of person coming in uh, and, and hurting or attacking us without any fear of being told what we can or cannot say from the stage. Um, that is a beautiful thing that we as a country get to have the freedom in. The fact that the Bible, the Word of God, is the number one published book in all of the world. Uh, the fact that that is still happening even today and that here in America, you can easily get them for free even, um, is a beautiful thing that we as Americans have for free. Uh, and so I want to first acknowledge the great, the gratitude that I have to be able to be, even be here on this stage and preach the word of God uh, in a church that we can live in America and be as free as we are. And so first and foremost, I want to thank God for, uh, for today and what we get to celebrate this week. Um, today, we're also going to continue into a new sermon series. Woohoo! We made it through uh, Timothy, and Pastor, uh, Pastor Tim last week wrapped up our, the letters uh, between Paul and Timothy for us, and that was kind of exciting for me to read because, like I've said multiple times, discipleship is something that I get really excited about, and so being able to read the mail between one person and his disciple and, and be able to figure out the best ways that we can do active discipleship is a beautiful thing. And so to be able to read through that, to study that together was really fun. And I'm really excited to be able to um, kind of move on and continue on to figure out what it is um, to unlock discipleship for us this year. And so that next topic, that next key that we're going to use to unlock discipleship is the key of prayer. That is what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks. And this one is incredibly important. Um, well, I mean, they're all important, uh, the different keys for discipleship, but this seems like next to the gospel, it seems like one of the most important things that we can do as believers. You know, even here at church, um, we have, you know, we have the music, we have the message, uh, we have fellowshipping together after service, different times we have our luncheons and everything, but we also have prayer. That is something that is integral to what we do. So today, what we're going to do is give a little introduction uh, to what prayer is and begin to explain different types of prayer with that. Um, but to start off, a couple of things. Um, I'm going to have a lot of scripture today, which isn't bad, but if you have your Bible or have your app and you're like, man, I really want to just open it up. If you want to do the Bible Olympics and try to like breeze through and like catch up with me, praise God, please do. Um, but if you want, it's okay to like take a picture of the screen real quick or even just write down the references that we're going to be going over just to keep up, read through it later because um, there's going to be a lot of scripture. Um, also, my wife dropped off some coffee and so I'm like rah, really energetic right now. <laughs> so got to like take a breath because um, it is woo, in the veins right now. Um, man, who am I? Um, but I think to start, start things off today... Um, I want to give a description of what prayer is, describe it, what it's like. And I think the simplest way that we can describe prayer is simply by saying that it is talking to God. That is prayer. We are talking to God. Uh, and that's it. 
when you boil it down to the essence of what it is, we are talking to God. And, and there's some people who are kind of intimidated by prayer, and that's okay too. Like the acknowledgement that we are talking to the creator of the universe and we are to revere him is something that is very true. But we are also talking to our Father in heaven who loves us and wants intimacy with us as his friends and as his children. The first verse we're going to read is Luke, uh, Luke 11, verse 11 through 13, and it says this, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So like a very good father would want to have a relationship with his children and give things to his son or daughter, our Father in heaven wants to have that closeness and that connection with him. Oddly enough, though, our prayer life and the prayer life of the people in America can be pretty complicated or can be a little skewed and a little weird. Um, and so right now what I'm going to do is kind of go through a few different statistics that I've seen about what prayer is to the people of America. Uh, now this um, research article that I found is from the Barna Group. And they do research articles all the time. This one was done in 2017. That's the most recent one I could find as far as information about prayer and specifically prayer within the church as well. Uh, and so this one uh, is from 2017. And what was really fascinating about this is that the metric that they used for somebody who prays was somebody who's prayed once within the last three months. Once in three months. Crazy, right? Now, I think they're trying to like pad the numbers a little bit here because it's like, it makes sense um, because they were also doing all Americans. So people who believe in God, who don't believe in God, people who believe in other gods and prayer. And so they're asking all these people, but I think the metrics and the statistics that we find can speak a lot into who we are as well as believers. So the first question that they asked was, what was, how did you pray most often? And 82% of people that answered said that they prayed silently by themselves, which is fine. That's pretty good. Um, that was followed up with 13% who say that they prayed audibly by themselves. And then again, followed up by 2% who said they prayed audibly with other people around. And another 2% that said that they prayed um, in a church environment. And at first I read that and I was like, oh my gosh, that's insane. 2% in the church. But then I was like, no, this is how they mostly prayed. And so if people mostly prayed here in the church, that would make me sad because that's here, we're here once a week. And you can pray and talk to God on the way to whatever else you're doing. You can talk to him on the way to buy fireworks later. Like we have the chance to communicate with him. But then the next question that they asked was kind of like the demographic of people that prayed the most for personal health and wellness back in 2017. And those kind of demographics were elderly adults people who made less than $50,000 a year, and people who were in rural or small towns. Um, the next one that was kind of mentioned was praying for a sense of peace. And this took up one third of the content of prayers that was listed. And this was mostly noted, 43% uh, of people with children under the age of 18, which makes sense. Prayer for peace and stability in the home I can only imagine the torture I put my mom through at that age. My son's six months old. I'm already praying for peace, and he's doing pretty good so far. <laughs> just, I, yeah, just, exactly. Just wait. Be praying for me now. Pray for Gianna now specifically, because he's getting bigger and louder already, um, which is so fun. Love him <sighs> so much. Uh, praying for global problems and other injustices around the world. This actually only took up one-fifth of people's prayers. And this was mostly prayed for by black Americans, uh, more so than white Americans. And that's not like a, a racial statement. It's just an interesting observation that was done in this study. Generally speaking, gratitude and thanksgiving was the highest rated w thing that people prayed for, followed up by family and community. So between people who believe in God, who believe in other gods, or even don't believe in God at all, you can see that there's still this importance of prayer, right? Right? But back in, in 20, or 20, 2005, 20, uh, 2005 uh, Barna did another research article, and in that, they said this, prayer is one of three critical spiritual dimensions which most local churches essentially ignore. 
Prayer is said to be one of the top priorities in less than 4% of the churches surveyed. Why would that be? Why is it something that can so easily be missed or treated as just some transitional thing that we do between announcements and music or music and the message? Why is it something treated as something that we should do rather than what we get to do? And I believe that we as people, not just as Americans, but people as humans, we have this deep desire to take care of things on our own. We want the gratification of knowing that, man, I was able to accomplish something without the help of my dad or without the help of anyone else in my life. And that's me on a bad day. Like, I feel good about myself when it's like, man, I accomplished something and I didn't need to ask for money or I didn't need to ask for any kind of input from someone else. It was just on me and I feel good. But that's me on a bad day. And it reminds me of this sermon illustration that I heard one time. And I, I don't know if this story is real or not. I don't even remember where I heard it from, but I think it is a really good reflection of what we're going to be talking about. And the story goes like this. There was a foreign pastor who was really curious about how church was done in America. I was really excited about it. And so what he did is he set up this time for him to be able to come to America and then get a tour of some different churches that were um, pretty notable, um, pretty well-known, did, uh, did a lot of different things. And so what he did is he set up a connection with somebody uh, here in the States, and then he goes and starts off at this first church. The guy brings him to it, and he stands there, and he's just kind of quietly observing, you know, he's participating in the worship and with the music and reading his Bible and everything, but he's just kind of quietly observing, just watching. And the guy who brought him there is kind of looking at him and he's like, okay, hope it's going well. And the next week they go to another church, same thing. The, the, the foreign pastor comes in and he's just standing there. He's watching, he's observing quietly. And this happens a few more times at a few more different churches and the guy at the end of it that was kind of touring the foreign pastor around, he asked him, he's like, hey, so what did you think? What did you think of the church in America? And he said, oh, man, you guys are incredible. It's incredible what you can do. Um, the, the, it's incredible what you're doing in the communities around you, the way that you're serving, uh, the people that you're with. It's amazing to see what you're able to do to provide for the people that are in your congregation, for the widows, for the orphans. It's incredible to see people volunteer freely their time and energy to be able to come and, and participate with what's happening at the church. It's amazing how much money and how much production you guys have, but it's amazing to see how much you can do without the Holy Spirit. And man, that hits. Because what's amazing to me is that oftentimes we here working, even working here at the church, it's easy to get lost in the job of what we're trying to do rather than lost in who it is that's given us that job and what we're here to do it for and who we're here serving. Every decision we make should be considered and consulted by the Holy Spirit. Our first option when we go to do anything should be through the Holy Spirit and in prayer before anything else. And this isn't for those that just work in the church, like me or Pastor Mark or anybody else. I've heard from time and time again that the church is not just the building, right? You are the church. The people are the church. But you know what God says? The, the, the way that God describes his church? He says the church will be known as a house of prayer. That's how he describes his church. And in both Matthew 21 and Mark 11, there's this telling of the same story when Jesus comes into the temple and he's like throwing stuff. And he's causing a big old ruckus because people are misusing his temple, his house. I'm going to read to you uh, the Mark 11 uh, telling of the story. But in Mark 11, it says, On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Now, when Jesus is saying these things, he's actually quoting two of the Old Testament prophets, both Isaiah and Jeremiah. In Isaiah 56, we see God commanding Isaiah to say this, 
He says, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And in Jeremiah 7, Jeremiah was commanded by God to stand at the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim this message. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known? And then come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name and say, we are safe, safe to do all the detestable things. Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? But I've been watching, declares the Lord. So as you can tell, it's kind of a big deal. Everything that we do, it's also apparently a really big deal, not just to the people of faith, because what do people say, uh, either on Facebook or in the news or whatever, what do people say when some kind of tragedy happens? People usually say like, oh, my thoughts and prayers go out to you and your family. How many of you guys have heard that phrase? My thoughts and prayers, the T's and P's go out to you and your family. And when people say that, it's not really saying anything. They're not, unless they are hopefully, you know, communicating to God on behalf of someone. Typically, when people just say, oh, our thoughts and prayers, like they know that prayer is powerful, and yet they don't know what they're praying to or for. The Holy Spirit even actually prays on our behalf. Romans 8, 26 and 27 says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So yes, it's a very big deal. And it's an incredibly important way for us to be able to communicate to God, whether by our own words or even through the words of God himself that resides within us. Prayer is so important to God that he is even willing to use his own self to communicate to him. That's incredible. So as we are talking about prayer, there's a couple of things that I want to keep in mind as we are kind of moving along. The first thing with prayer to keep in mind is that persistence is key. In the book of Luke chapter 18, Jesus is with his disciples and he's telling the certain parable about this persistent widow, right? In this passage, Jesus is telling them this story about this woman who um, is a widow and she is constantly, every single day, going up to this judge day after day after day, asking for justice against the person who uh, did wrong against her. And after a certain amount of time, this judge just kind of reluctantly gives her what she asks for. He, he eventually says, okay, fine. But his heart isn't because he cares for her. It's just he's annoyed. And this is what Jesus says in his response to his disciples. He says, listen to the un- what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. So this is great news for us who are part of the kingdom of God. Those of us who have been adopted into his family and are heirs to his kingdom. If there are people in this world who don't even believe in God and yet still pray, then how much better is it for us who know the creator of the universe to be able to communicate to him? But we cannot give up when we don't get an answer right away. But you know who's really good at this? This persistence? It's my son. Not like in praying, but when he tells me what he wants... He's really good at continuously telling me what he wants, especially when he's tired or hungry. 
Like, he'll sit there, and he'll tell me, Dad, I'm hungry. Well, I mean, he says it in a different way, but he tells me that he's tired or hungry. And when he does, right away, I'm so excited to be able to prepare what he needs in order to be satisfied right away. But you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't stop telling me he's tired or hungry. No, he keeps reminding me that he's tired or hungry. And I say, buddy, it's coming. Your bottle's almost done, I promise. And so when I eventually give it to him, then he's happy, you know, he smiles. Um, But all the while, he does not stop telling me what he needs. And that's okay. And I'm happy to give him what he needs. Granted, I am also happy to make sure that he stops crying, um, but happy to provide for him nonetheless. And it's, it's different with God, obviously, because I don't think God gets annoyed with our persistence, but he is also happy to fulfill the needs that we have. And he knows how to fulfill those needs even before we ask for him. But that doesn't stop us from persistently asking God for help. So persistence is key. And the second thing that we need to pray about and to keep in mind is to pray for everything. Pray about everything. Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. This is for everything, not just for the things that we need, not just when we're struggling, not when things are going really, really well and it's absolutely amazing and everything's awesome. This is for everything. And we've had a hard morning and we've got to go into work. Pray about it. Ask God for help. When you get a random reimbursement check or your your tax return finally comes in, pray about it and thank God for this blessing that you didn't have before. And so the last thing now to keep in mind with prayer is that we should be praying for everyone. Persistence is key. Pray about everything and pray for everyone. We just finished our series in Timothy, but I think 1 Timothy chapter 2 says it best when Paul says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So we should be praying for our country's leaders. We should be praying for our leaders even in our own state. We should be praying for those that are in authority over us. We should be praying for the injustices and the things that are wrong, that anguish God that happen around the world. And I know I mentioned earlier that mostly black Americans prayed for global problems and injustices, but even that statistic was was saddingly low. Only 27% of black Americans who prayed prayed for global problems. And for the white Americans who were surveyed, only 19%, 19% prayed for global problems. And again, I don't say this as like a racial comparison, but mostly I think all of us as American citizens have a duty and an ability, and especially those of us who believe in God, to pray for everything that is happening around the world. Not just the people that we like, not just the people that we agree with, but every single person. There's a Danish uh, theologian and philosopher and an author named Soren Kierkegaard. It's a fun name to say. But this guy who's also quoted to saying this, the function of prayer is not to influence God, but rather to change the nature of the person who prays. Prayer changes us, not God who cannot change. When we come into his presence in prayer, we are on holy ground And like Isaiah of old, we are transformed by our nearness to him. So let's take that quote now and the topic of prayer and bring that together with the the full understanding of discipleship and what that is. What is the point of discipleship? It's for us to make disciples of Jesus, right? Not just people who come to church. And so if prayer is something that changes us, then it needs to be an integral part of what we do as disciples and as disciplers. Because it's not us that are changing people. We, we can't force that change to happen on someone else. That's not the point. We are not perfect and cannot make someone perfect, but God can. We need God to intervene and to change the life of the people that we meet with because it is only by his power that lives can be changed. 
So with the time that we have left this morning, I want to talk through some of these types of prayer that we can do. Um, This is not an extensive list. I'm sure you can find other types of prayer, but there's five that I want to look at for the next couple of weeks. There's supplication, intercessory, that's a hard one, intercessory, confession, thanksgiving, and adoration. Now, in looking at these, there seems to kind of be three types of prayer that are mostly focused on ourselves or the things that we need or confessing something else. And all the while, we're still acknowledging that God is creator and we're we're, we're kind of giving him authority in it. But then the other two are more focused on God himself and the gratitude that we can express back to him and that we can acknowledge also back to God who he is in our life. So let's begin first with supplication. Simply put, supplication is just asking for things, right? They're asking uh, for things uh, that we need or want or, or have. Truly, when we're praying uh, for yourself for these things, uh, it's okay to do that. Uh, it, it may sound kind of bad, but it's something that God actually asks for us to do. He wants us to do. So I want to look at a couple of verses that kind of give us a little more insight on that. First is James 1, chapter 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Now, I know that this is specifically talking about wisdom in itself, obviously, but I I think with this, James is saying, hey, if you lack wisdom, ask for it. If you need something, ask for it. God wants to give that to you. It's as simple as that. And later on in James chapter 4, he says, You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you gain, what you get on your pleasure. So don't grow weary or in too much want of something that you don't have. And know that it is okay to ask God for the things that you need. Time and time again, we see throughout the New, New Testament of Scripture and even the Old, prayers of people who ask God for the things that they don't have. And when we do this, what's happening is it's actually allowing us to come before God with a humble and broken and contrite heart saying that we don't have it all together, but we need your help. Now, let me use my son again for an example. Unfortunate circumstance of being a pastor's kid. He's always going to be the sermon illustration for the rest of his life. So if you're listening to this later on, buddy, I'm so sorry. I'm I'm not sorry. I'm using you, so it's fine. Um, But right now, at least, I know exactly what he needs to survive, right? He's an infant. Food, sleep, change a diaper, spend time with grandma. Like, those are the things that he needs. So I I can easily make that happen. But as he grows up and as he gets older, there are going to be things that he is interested in. There's going to be things that he wants to do. And and hopefully I will be an involved enough father to be able to recognize those things and invest some of my own time into that to help him grow and, and get excited and be more interested in what those things are. And... I will give him opportunities to do those things. And all he has to do is ask. And that's okay. And hopefully I'll be there. And and where it's different with God is that he sits outside of time and he knows all things. And so he already knows every single detail and every single thing that we need or want. And he is already providing it for us. But when we ask him, we are now humbling ourselves and saying that we don't have it together and we need his assistance. So that's supplication. Let's move now into intercessory prayer. Uh, And the basic definition for this is praying, asking God for something on behalf of someone else or for the sake of someone else, Uh, where supplication is asking God for something for yourself. Intercessory prayer is asking on behalf of another person. What's great about this, uh, aside from supplication, intercessory prayer is very common throughout both the Old and New Testament. Um, the, the first moment that comes to mind for me, even thinking about it, is in Luke chapter 23, when, God, uh, when Jesus is on the cross and he says, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. That's Jesus on the cross, interceding for the people that are there to crucify him. Another moment of intercession uh, we see is all the way back in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 18. Um, This is after Lot and Abraham 
uh, have split up their land. Abraham says, hey, Lot, I want you to have some land. And he's like, I like that land over there. And he's like, great, have fun. Sends them off. He takes over what, the, what land would be known as Sodom and Gomorrah later on. And we see even in chapter 19 that Lot has actually positioned himself into a place of leadership within the city of Sodom. We see in chapter 19, it says that he is sitting at the gate of the city, and that place is only reserved for the higher-ups, for the wealthy, for the, the leadership of the city to say who can come in and out of, of the city. And so we know that he's positioned himself into a place of leadership there. But what's happening in, in chapter 18 now is that there are these three kind of mysterious visitors that come to visit Abraham and his wife, Sarah. And they spend some time with them, but then as they leave, they're saying they're, they're going to go and destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and Abraham, knowing that his nephew Lot is there, intercedes with these three mysterious guests for the sake of his nephew, for Lot. And it starts off with him saying, well, if there's only uh, at least 50 men that are righteous, then don't destroy the city. And they're like, okay, if there's 50. And he's like, uh, wait, wait, 45. I'm like, okay, 45. And he's like, ah, and that turns into 40, which turns into 30, then 20. And then if there's even 10 righteous men, would you not destroy the city? And they're like, yes, if there's at least 10, we won't destroy the city. We find out that that's there's like no one righteous in that town and it gets destroyed. But what is happening is Abraham is interceding for the sake of Lot because he loves him. Where else do we see intercessory prayer? Well, we see it in 1 Kings chapter 18. We see it in Daniel 9. We see, even see it again in John chapter 17, right before Jesus was supposed to be crucified. He spent time out praying on behalf and for his disciples and for all believers. What's great about this type of prayer is that it kind of seems very on the nose for what we're trying to accomplish with discipleship, right? Like I mentioned already with that quote that uh, it's not us that are changing, our, our prayers don't change God, it changes us. And if we acknowledge that we aren't the ones that are actually changing the person, then prayer is absolutely necessary. Then we need to be praying for the person we're discipling. And we need to encourage them to pray if they are truly, truly able and are, if they are truly going to change and become a disciple of Jesus. Now, the last type of prayer that I'm going to go over today is confession. Um, Pastor Mark will kind of pick up the last couple of the next week. Um, but I want to wrap up with this third kind of prayer, which is confession. And this is not to be confused with the Catholic tradition of confession, um, which uh, their kind of definition of what that process is, is a sacrament instituted by Jesus Christ and his love and mercy to offer sinners forgiveness for offenses against God and against uh, your sisters and brothers. Confession brings reconciliation between God and the penitent, between the penitent and others, and the individual penitent themselves. So the, for those that are unfamiliar with this practice of confession, uh, it's where you come before a priest who in their, uh, their faith, uh, they say that the priest stands in the name of Christ and the church. You ask the priest for a, a blessing. You begin to confess your sins that you've committed since the last confession that you made. The priest then, taking into account the individual person and the circumstances in their life, will then assign a type of penance to that individual so that way they can be joined with Christ on the cross. And that could be a prayer, an offering, some kind of works of mercy, service, or sacrifice. But it is the priest then who absolves you of your sin through the prayer of absolution. Now, the act of confession to God when we admit our sins is an appropriate act to do, but we do not need a priest in order to do that. You see, we believe that Jesus has already absolved us of our sin and forgiven us of the sins that we have committed, are committing, and will commit by the death and resurrection on the cross. But does that mean for us to be able to continue on sinning because we have that freedom? As Paul would say in, in the book of Romans chapter 6, by no means. We are those who have died in sin. How can we live in it any longer? You see, the act of confession softens our hearts because we then humble ourselves and admit where we're wrong. Proverbs 28, 13 says, Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. 
In Psalm 51, verse 4, David is in this moment where he is confessing his sin after what had happened with Bathsheba and uh, Bathsheba's husband. And he says, Against you and you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. And in the book of James, chapter 5, James says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray to, with each other for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. 1 John 1, nine. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. But it doesn't stop with just confessing. There needs to be repentance. With confession comes repentance. Acts 3, 19 through 20 says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may, be, may send the Messiah who has been appointed to you, even Jesus. Think of like a, a criminal, right? Who commits a, a crime, come, goes to jail, comes before a judge and says, oh, judge, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have done it. And he's like, you know what? You're right. You shouldn't have done it. Here's your bail. Like, go and, and crime no more. And so he goes out and then he does the same crime, the exact same crime again, goes to jail, comes before a judge, looks at the judge, oh, judge, I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have done it. And he's like, yeah, you really shouldn't have done it again. And so he sends him out again on bail, and, but he continues this cycle of committing the same crime and then and going about his business, coming back out just to commit the same crime. Like, you cannot look at that kind of person and say that their life has changed. And the same goes for us. We can say whatever we want to God. We can tell him all the things that we've done wrong, but if we do not repent of our sins, then our hearts cannot change to look more like his. The function of prayer is to not influence God, right? Our admission of guilt doesn't change God's heart himself. He loves us. He already died for our sins. But when we pray, what happens is that there's a change of nature that needs to happen. And so from our confession to our repentance, there's a change that must happen. So what do we do with this? What does this kind of information dump have to do with us today? I think the biggest thing to keep in mind, or really the biggest encouragement that I can give all of you today, is to just start praying. I don't know where you're at in your prayer life, if you are the person who prays once every three months, or if you pray for 30 minutes every single morning. Just know that this is something that God wants us to do. He wants you to have this kind of relationship with him, this closeness with him. That yes, we are to revere him as Lord, but also be close to him as father and friend. We are meant to be changed by God through the Holy Spirit. And one of the best ways that we can do this is simply by talking to him. When we humble ourselves before the Lord and acknowledge that our need and dependence on, on who he is is what we actually need, then our lives will be able to change for the better. And we're able to look more like who God is. So here's my challenge for us today. I'm sure you've heard, you know, to pray without ceasing. But my challenge for all of us, even, even myself, is to make that time of prayer even more intentional. So again, whether you pray once every three months, like take that time of prayer that you have and really make it intentional with God. So even, let's say you have a really tough meeting before work. Pray and ask God for the, the soft heart to lovingly and be able to navigate whatever meeting you may have. Maybe you're kind of down in the dumps about some sin that's hanging over you. My suggestion to you then is to confess that to God, but then take the time to intentionally acknowledge where you're falling short and ask the Holy Spirit to purify you and to purify your heart. Maybe you're actually really good about asking God for things, but you never or rarely ask God for help with somebody else, or you rarely pray for someone else. Like the classic scenario, right, of, oh, I'll be praying for you, but then you never do. Don't be that person. Either take the time and actually pray for them right then and there or set a reminder on your phone so that way you can actually intentionally pray for this other person on behalf of this other person. You see, prayer doesn't have to be complicated. 
It's actually a very, a very sweet gift that we have to even be able to talk to the creator of the universe and not just talk to him, to even listen to him. The fact that he would want to communicate to us as well. So take advantage of that gift. Use that gift. And before you know it, you'll begin to see your heart change to begin to look more like his. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for the gift that it is to be able to talk to you. We thank you, Lord, that we get to have time here today to freely worship you, to be in a place and in a country where we get to glorify your name and not be afraid of anything else. And so today, God, I ask that you would change our hearts even now, that Holy Spirit, you'd be stirring in us and give us a chance to be able to intentional, intentionally pray for the things that you've put on our hearts, whether that's for ourselves, for someone else. And Lord, if there is a sin that is in our way from being able to effectively talk to you, God, I, I pray that our people would be committed to confessing that to you so that way there is no block, there is no barrier between us and you. And so, Lord, we, we need you. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would humble us and allow us to look more and more like you this week. So, God, we love you, we need you, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, we're talking about prayer, so let's pray before we start. Heavenly Father, we just... We lay down before you. We put ourselves down before you. And Lord, we just pray that we will have a posture of understanding this morning. We will have a posture of wisdom. We will have a posture of openness that we can hear your word this morning. Lord, we just ask that you speak to our hearts. Lord, we pray that we will accept the Holy Spirit and allow it to move in us, to give us the sort of wisdom we need this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in part two of prayer. If you would like to turn to a specific part of your Bible, then we're going to be in Psalms today, um, specifically Psalm 19, Psalm 57, and Psalm 95. Those are kind of the three main parts of Scripture this morning. But we're, this is part two of our sermon series on prayer. And if you're just coming into this year, if you haven't uh, been part of the sermon series so far, this year is the overarching theme of discipleship. We've been focusing on what it is to be a disciple of Christ. Because when we accept Jesus into our lives, when we accept Christ into our lives, when we commit ourselves to the Lord, we also commit to that responsibility to develop ourselves as a disciple of His. And it's not just a once and done thing. We don't just say, okay, we've got salvation, that's the end of that, now let's get on with our normal programming. It doesn't work like that. It's an ongoing thing that we do throughout our lives. Being a disciple isn't something that we complete. They don't give us a certificate and say, here you are, you are now a disciple of Christ. It's an ongoing process because the nature of it is that we are constantly learning. The Holy Spirit is constantly working in us in different circumstances, in different ways, at different times in our lives, and it gives us a different perspective, so it's constant process throughout. But prayer is one of those things that is critical to the development of our relationship with God. <clears throat> and if you're someone that doesn't pray, or if you're someone that doesn't pray very often, or if perhaps you're someone that says, I don't need to pray. God knows what's in my mind. God knows what's going on. Why do I need to speak to God? He's already aware of it. If you are one of those people, then I'd ask you just to imagine any other relationship in your life where you don't speak. Imagine marrying somebody. You meet somebody, you marry someone, and you're in a relationship with them, but you never talk to them. They're talking to you, but you don't respond. Maybe you're not even listening. And there's some women saying, well, that is my marriage. <laughs> but it's different. But how would that relationship go? You, you can't make friends with people without first talking to them. You can't establish relationships without first talking to people. Outside of family, because we all know that you can be in a relationship with someone in your family but never speak to them. I understand that. But outside of family... We cannot have relationship with people without actually talking to them. So with that in mind, what makes us think that we can have a productive and intimate relationship with God if we do not communicate with Him? 
And I'm very aware that there's a lot of people that want to communicate with God. There's a lot of people that want to pray. They have that innate like, desire to communicate with God, but just don't know how. Don't know where to begin. And that's part of why we're doing this sermon series right now on prayer. To ensure that all believers, anyone striving to be a disciple in Christ, can find a way to speak to God and develop a communication that, that ultimately leads to an intimate relationship with Him. I think most, in general, most Christians would say that out of all of their faith life, prayer is one of those areas that they fall down on or they, they find the most challenging thing in their particular faith life. And we already find it challenging. And then what happens is we go to somebody's house, there's a lot of people there, and we sit down for a meal. Let's say we sit down for a hamburger, and they say, okay, I'm going to pray. And what happens next is they start this long dissertation of biblical knowledge and history, the challenge to world leaders and all Christian leaders alike. They pray for everything in the world that could possibly need prayer, and suddenly we feel like we're not quite as grateful for the hamburger as they are. <laughs> because it's intimidating. It makes us feel intimidated. And right then and there, we silently vow to ourselves, I'm never going to pray out loud because I can't do it like that. That's where the intimidation sets in. But it's not a good reason. It's not a good reason not to pray. First of all, Pastor Tim always says that when you sit down for a meal, you shouldn't do these long dissertations because it's not a good time to catch up with your prayer time. It's meal time. People are hungry. Don't make it a long, drawn-out prayer. But it can be intimidating when you hear someone pray with such an easy flow. Somebody that just seems to know what to say, when to say it, how to say it. And it just comes off as so natural. But we don't need to overthink this idea of prayer. We don't want to overcomplicate this in our mind. because, And this is constantly reinforced by events that happen. We have things like prayer chains and prayer events. We have prayer retreats. And while all those things are very good, sometimes it makes it more of an event than it needs to be. Because at the end of the day, it's a conversation with the Lord, and it's personal. D.L. Moody once said, I'd rather be able to pray than to be a great preacher. Jesus Christ never taught his disciples how to preach. He taught them how to pray. And you can bet that the Pharisees in Jesus' day were very good at praying. In fact, they would have made quite a show out of praying. The amount of time that they can pray, they probably try to outdo each other all the time. But it's just unnecessary. And there's a story that I visited in Luke 18, which uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, as part of the sermon series on Timothy, I talked about this particular story, and that is the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector, or the publican praying. And Jesus tells this story uh, in Luke 18, verse 10, it says, Two men went to the temple to pray, and one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven. But he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted." So two very different postures for prayer, very much in stark contrast to each other. The Pharisee started off well. He said, thank you, God. Good start that I'm not like all these other people. Got off track. He was thanking God for the wrong thing. He was thankful. That's great. But then he went off track. And then the tax collector, he felt unworthy. He felt unrighteous. He described himself as a sinner, which the Pharisee would never do to that degree, and he asked God for mercy, which is more sincere, which is more heartfelt, and which one ultimately will please God the most? Well, obviously, the tax collector's humility. I just finished a study on Job. It was a Wednesday night Bible study that we were doing. There was a group of adults doing that, and it was great. We just finished it up. Francis Chan was doing the video teaching. And in the last session of that particular um, video series that we did, Francis Chan said, after humility comes grace. The tax collector, as sinful as he was, he communicated his prayer to God with humility. And from that comes grace. Because Jesus states at the end of this passage, for all those who exalt themselves or lift themselves up, they will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. 
The thief on the cross prayed directly to Jesus. He was being crucified right next to Jesus. And after defending Jesus to the other thief that was on the other cross, he simply said to Jesus, remember me. What could be a more simple prayer than that? What could be more heartfelt than that? Or it could have been the father of the demon-possessed boy who said, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. When the disciples were caught in a storm, they woke up Jesus because they were panicking and they said a prayer to him, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. When Peter was going under the water after he had made his walk across the, across the sea to go to Jesus, he started sinking and what did he say to Jesus? Lord, save me. All of these prayers were answered. Of course, there were emergency situations. They didn't have a lot of time to come up with this eloquent, long prayer. They didn't have much time to put together this sort of well-positioned prayer that would have been potentially dangerous. But when you look at these prayers, all of them that were answered, you have to be struck by one thing, and that's the simplicity of them. And what do they all have in common? They all come from a sincere heart. And that's what the Lord wants from us. He wants us to approach Him with a sincere heart. The timing of prayer isn't important either. Any time, any day, every day. There was a Christian writer that once said she could visualize millions of prayers hurtling towards God at mealtime. So she decided to do her praying between meals when the prayer traffic was not so heavy. (laughs) She got up early to do her prayer and before the breakfast sort of rush came in. Of course, this is silly, but making time for prayer is important, even if you end up Doing it at certain times a day for certain reasons, it doesn't matter as long as it's being done. Something else that we should consider about praying is that it's a two-way conversation. It's two-way. There's one thing to pray in public and then sign off. But here's the deal. We tend to pick up the phone. We start off our prayer, dear God, whatever it is, that's picking up the phone. We tell God things. We ask God for things. We plead for God, with, with God for things. We thank Him for things. And then we hang up. Meanwhile, God is there listening to us. Because in Jeremiah 29, 12, it says, Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. So God is listening to us pray. He is poised. And then we hang up. Not listening to our side. And we don't listen Because silence makes us uncomfortable. Especially nowadays. Silence makes us uncomfortable. And even though God will communicate with us, we have to first silence our mind. We have to silence ourselves from this busy and crazy world. And that is really hard. Because once we're ready to listen, then God will speak to us in a variety of different ways. And he will guide us in different ways. Personally, I know that God speaks to me and guides me. It appears in my mind as something that I never would have thought of. It happened when I, was, when, when I got this crazy idea to go to Bible school, to go to seminary. I didn't particularly enjoy school, so I knew this wasn't coming from me. I would never have thought of go back to school. But there it was. This idea came into my head and, well, I decided to go do it. Of course, some of the smarter things that I occasionally say, they're not from me. That's the Holy Spirit. It couldn't possibly be from me. So whatever way God will move you, the best way to find out is to sit in silence and don't hang up the phone too soon. Don't make your demands, slam down the phone, just wait and be intentional about this time and you may be surprised what will reveal itself to you. And there are plenty of people, there are preachers, respected preachers, and there may be some of you in here that would say to me, that's not biblical. It doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that this is a two-way conversation. Jesus didn't start saying to his disciples, this is how you pray, and then at the end you just wait. He doesn't say that at all. I agree. It does not say that in the Bible. If you choose to believe that, then just hang up the phone. But I can tell you that I have had true times of revelation in my life that come from the process of listening after prayer. So if they want to tell me how God is going to speak to me, then perhaps they should consider that as much as God speaks to us through his word and as much as God speaks to us through the actions that happen in our lives, we should be equally open to the potential that God, in all his power and all his wisdom, would not miss the opportunity to speak to us in some way if we were to take the posture of listening after prayer. 
Another consideration about prayer is that it should be a priority. Last week, Kyle talked about persistence, and here's another P, priority. Prayer should be a priority in our lives. It should be the first thing that we think about in the day, and we should welcome the day thanking the Lord for that day. Jesus modeled this idea of prioritizing prayer in Mark 1.35, where it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went into a solitary place where he prayed. First thing in the morning, before he did anything else, he got up, he went to pray to his Father in solitude. Not a big show in public, but in solitude to connect with him. He made it a priority. And that would have been his daily routine, not just in a crisis, this would have been his daily routine. But on the day, of course, that he went to Gethsemane, we can excuse him for using that in a, in, a, in a crisis situation. He knew that the day was not going to be a normal day. He knew what was coming that day, so he went to the Lord in more of a crisis mode that day, prayed to him, pleaded with him, appealed to him, but ultimately obeyed him. That was a different kind of prayer, but we, we would know that it would have been his daily routine. I think an important lesson that we can learn from this is that prayer shouldn't just be a tool in a crisis. Absolutely, we should turn to prayer when things are going badly, when all, all of our world seems to be in turmoil. Absolutely, we should turn to prayer. A hammer can be used in self-defense if somebody breaks into your house. It would certainly be very effective at self-defense. A hammer could be used to break down a door if your house is on fire and you can't get out. Use a hammer to get out. But its primary role is to pound in nails. Its primary role is to help us hang pictures, to help us do DIY around the house, or to use it in our workplace if we happen to be a carpenter. But in the same way, prayer can be a great tool in a crisis. It works very well, but primarily, it should be a day-to-day -day activity, a habit that we get into. Get up, we pray, we brush our teeth, we take a shower, have breakfast, whatever it is we do in the morning, it should be on that list somewhere as something that we do on a regular basis. Because the effect that it has is that it prioritizes our relationship. In our relationships with people, the people that we interact with the most, the ones on a regular basis, those are our strongest relationships in our life. The people, there are, there are also people that we don't communicate with very much, but we just call them in a crisis. Those are not strong, intimate relationships. Those are people that we probably take advantage of sometime if we only call them in a crisis. But there's people that we call and we text regularly because we need people in our lives. Sometimes we just check in once a year at Christmas with a Christmas card, the all too impersonal sort of Christmas card that comes along and gives a quick outline of what's happening in our lives. That's the check in once a year type relationship that we have. And then there's people in high school that we grew up with, those BFFs. <laughs> but is it really forever? But those are the people at the time we think, I can't possibly imagine my life without this person because that's all the people I've known in my life, my whole life. And then you move away. You get busy. Things change. You began to gradually drift apart. And soon you know very little about what's going on in their life. You know very little about uh, the, the sort of family or the family dynamic or what's happening. And soon you become strangers. Strangers with history, but you become strangers in the present time. And this can happen with the Lord. We forget. We put it off till tomorrow. We put it off till the next day or the next day. And soon we begin to drift from him and we feel like a stranger in our relationship with him. And I'm sure everybody's experienced that at some point. We suddenly realize you haven't prayed to God for a long time. And the first time you do after that, you just feel a little bit strange, like you're not quite connected. It takes a bit of time to get back into that relationship. But our relationship with God will become deeper and richer and infinitely more intimate if we prioritize it on a daily basis. Because if we don't, he either becomes a friend that we just call in a crisis, or he becomes someone that we just check in with at Christmas, or Easter, or both. So prioritizing prayer. And then we should consider another P in this process of prayer. Privacy, or privacy, as we say in England. Privacy. <laughs> How many people... I have to consciously say it the right way. But when... You know, people beat themselves up when they, they think about praying in public. And by public, I mean just anyone except just them. And there are occasions as Christian leaders and in our church where we should pray in public. Whether we are 
a leader in the church, whether a small group leader, a ministry leader, whatever it is, absolutely we should be praying in public. We should be a praying church. We should be praying for the circumstances. We should be praying for people in our church, whatever the need is. But primarily, first and foremost, the vast majority of our prayer time should be in private. Notice Jesus left the house and he went out to a place of solitude to pray. I'm not aware of a single occasion when Jesus publicly asked for a prayer meeting. He condemned the Pharisees who prayed in public, mostly because of the way they were doing it, mostly because they were doing it for show. They were trying to make sure that everyone knew they were the religious leaders. But he told his disciples to pray in secret and in the closet. So with this in mind, both Jesus both theoretically and in his own life practically lived out this idea of praying in private. Again, it comes back to this idea of intimacy. You could talk to somebody that you love in public, but the conversation you're going to have with them is going to be a little bit different than the conversation you have in private because of privacy and intimacy. You could talk, it just same thing happens with people that you meet. I stand outside our uh, sanctuary here on Sundays. On Sunday morning, I enjoy greeting those of you that I know, I enjoy meeting those of you that I haven't met yet. Because we're in a public place, our conversations are much more general. As much as I would love to get into deeper conversations with each, each and every one of you, to know you better, to understand the challenges in your life and how we can help as a church or the spiritual side of your life, how God is moving in your life, as much as I would like to do that with everybody, on a Sunday, first time is a factor, but also it's not private. It's not a private area. So it doesn't develop into a more personal and more intimate conversation because privacy and intimacy go hand in hand. And so in the same way, our relationship with God isn't so much formed in public praying, but the quiet and solitary times that we spend with him. It's developed in the intimate conversations. Jesus couldn't really pray in public a lot of what he wanted to say. You can imagine, I mean, he was always having trouble with disciples. He, if he, he's not going to pray in public to everybody that's there and say, what am I going to do with these sons of thunder? What am I going to do with Peter? He can't control himself. He gets angry at the drop of a hat. So he prayed in a personal way. A deeper relationship with the Lord is formed in private prayer that we share with him. Last week, Pastor Kyle did an introduction to the idea of prayer. One of the poignant things that he pointed out was this. It was related to this quote that he came up with with Kierkegaard, which is, the function of prayer is not to influence God, but rather to change the nature of the one who prays. And this is a really important quote when it comes to prayer. As he pointed out, disciples, as disciples, that's something that we should really focus on since it changes us. We can only help other people in their walk in a certain way. We can discipleship people, but we can only get them so far because if they don't personally pray to God, if they don't have a relationship personally with him, then there won't be the change that's needed. There won't be that transformation. But that's what we're looking for as disciples. When we have that relationship, then we begin to feel the change in us and the relationship with us and with him makes it so much stronger. It changes our nature. He also walked us through some of the different types of prayer, supplication, intercession, and confession. And we'll pick up on the list that he started with the last two that he talked about last week, which is the prayer of adoration and the prayer of thanksgiving. So the prayer of adoration. This is a powerful part of the prayer, uh, is to tell God how much we adore him. Tell God how much we love him. Uh, And if you think about your prayers, is that something that you incorporate into your prayers, or do we just start out... Dear Lord, here's what I need, even if it's not for me. But it's very important to to show God that we have a love and an adoration with him like nothing else. And we're beginning to infringe a little bit on what I want to talk about next week, which is how do we pray. But we're going to start off with this because adoration stands at the top of one of these acrostics that we have for prayer. And you probably know what I mean. It's like ACTS is one of them, A-C-T-S, the letters. Stand for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication, or asking for something. And there's others as well. Pray is one of them. P R A Y. Praise, read, ask, and yield. Heart is another one. Honesty, endurance, awe, repentance, and trust. But when it comes to acts, adoration is the A in acts. First thing that we should do in prayer according to that instruction. So, in order to fully understand how we pray to God with adoration, we first need to understand why we need to adore Him. Why do we need to love God? What is it about Him that we should love? 
And this is a huge subject. And we kind of touched on some of it in, when we talked about the attributes of God earlier this year. But what is it about God that you adore? If I was to ask that question, I'd get a wide range of answers that would be like his unfailing nature, his unconditional love, his patience, his grace, his magnificent power. And these are all good answers. I might even get someone that says, you know, his sense of humor, because he does have a sense of humor. But if you ever want a solid foundational text that shows us how to adore the Lord and understand what makes him someone that we should revere, then we can look at Psalm 19 because David loved the Lord. That's why the Psalms are so good when it comes to praise and thanksgiving and adoration to the Lord because David loved the Lord and he knew how to write about it. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They, have no, they use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of a chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit over to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing our soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are are firm and all of them are righteous they are more precious than gold and much much pure gold they are sweeter than honey than honey from a honeycomb they are that by them your servant is warned in in keeping with them is a great reward but who can discern their own errors forgive my hidden faults keep your servant also from willful sins may they not rule over me then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation in my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Don't you just love the way David writes? I mean, it's so poetic, it's outstanding. But the reality is that from one cover of this book to the other cover, we see reasons as to why we should adore the Lord our Father. In Genesis, we see that he is the great creator of the world. In Exodus, we see that he is the Redeemer. In Leviticus, he provides for us, for, by his, for his people, by setting them apart. And in Numbers, he is our guide. In Deuteronomy, he is our teacher. In Joshua, he is the mighty conqueror. In Judges, he provides leadership and victory over our enemies. I'm not going to go through every book of the Bible. Trust me. I can if you want, but... Skipping ahead to Acts. Acts, he is the savior of the world and he is the foundation of this church. I could go all through the books because in every single book there, is a, the book there is a characteristic of who God is and why we should adore him. But it culminates at the end in the book of Revelation where it says, where you can see the finale, where it describes him as the coming king, the triumphant king. That's why we should love him. So we're not short of things to adore about God. Because the list is long. And that's what we should be tapping into with this idea of praying with adoration. Even though the start of, even though this acrostic acts is like, that's just the A, that's just one letter in, in four. <laughs> I was like, how many letters is that? <clears throat> that's just one letter in four, so that's just how you start a prayer. Perhaps we could actually spend some time and just pray a prayer of adoration to him anyway. Just a one prayer, adoration, that's it. We're not asking for anything, just a prayer of adoration. That's how we should start. And at times, we don't need to get any others into any other side of prayer. Sometimes we just should come to him and show him how much we love him. So let's do that right now. Lord, you are amazing. Lord, you're everything. Your strength, your leadership in our lives is all we need. Lord, your creation and the intricate work that you have placed all around us can never be matched. It can never be recreated. It can never be understood because, Lord, your richness, the richness of your world is unfathomable to us. And so we often take it for granted. But, Lord, today we acknowledge that your greatness, your majesty, and your grace for us as our Father is what fills us with love for you that only grows and grows. We worship you, Lord. We adore you, Lord. 
We celebrate your presence in our lives and in the lives of the people around us. We pray in your mighty name. Amen. Prayer of adoration. How can we not adore him for what he has done for us? The second type of prayer that we'll look at today is prayer of thanksgiving. And again, this one seems obvious, pretty much what it is. We are giving prayers of thanks to the Lord. But why do we need to do this? Why do we need to, to thank God? And again, we re, we'll revisit uh, this idea of prayer changing us. Not changing God, because it can't change God. God is unchangeable, but it changes us. And so if we are in the mindset of thanking God, it pulls us into a position of gratitude, and it reminds us constantly that without God in the equation, then all we're doing is taking credit for everything that happens in our lives for ourselves. We're not thanking God, so what we just say, assuming that everything that happens in our lives, especially the good things, is attributed to us. Even though God is still there, we decide that we did all these things. We achieved whatever it is that we're proud of at that particular moment. And we exclude God from this because in our, our mind is just not thinking that way. And when we lose focus on God, on thanking God, then it begins to distort us spiritually. Not just in our minds, but what is it that drives our mind? It's our heart. So we become distorted spiritually in our hearts. The concept of prayers of thanksgiving ties in very closely with what we just talked about. Prayers of adoration. Because we give thanks, because we adore him. But we're also acknowledging his greatness, his strength, his power, and at the same time, loving him. Again, David was an incredible word artist in, in the Psalms, and he could wax lyrical about the greatness of God, the amazing attributes of God, and he could pray to him. He spent a lot of time thanking God as well, often in the same context. He'd thank him. Why? Because he was so great. So it's two things in one, thank, giving thanks and adoring at the same time. And Psalm 95 is a good example of that. Psalm 95 says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us uh, shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. And extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God. The great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. And the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his. For he made it. And his hands form the dry land. So here David says that we should come before him with thanksgiving. Why? Because the Lord is a great God. He is a great king. That is the adoration side of it. He tells us what we should thank him for. The depths of the earth. The mountain peaks. The sea. The dry land. And he continues in verse 6 and says, Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, His flock under His care. Bow down in worship. Why? Because we are thankful, thankful that He is our God. And this is the key point. This is why we should give thanks to Him always. But verse 7, we are the people of His pasture. We are His flock. And when we have nothing else in life, when we are stripped bare of all the resources in our life, when everybody else has stepped away from us and we're reaching a point of despair, the point is that we are still part of his flock, no matter what. He will never abandon us. No matter what's happening in our lives, no matter what kind of mistakes we make, no matter what kind of bad judgment we happen to show in different circumstances, he will always provide for us in one way or another. He will never step away. And we can't ignore this. Just as the same for adoration, we don't have to look far to find reasons to love God and to thank God. Right now, we are sitting in an air conditioning building. Thank God. We are talking about the Word of God. We are examining the Word of God. We're praying openly. We're worshiping openly. And there are many parts around the world where firstly, there's no air conditioning. But second, you cannot do that. You cannot talk about God in public. They have to do it in secret or they'll get arrested or perhaps even killed. So that alone is a reason to pray and adore God this morning and give thanks to Him. The very fact that we were born into this culture, into this Western privilege that we frequently take for granted, because God places all of us in different places, and we won the jackpot. I saw a documentary recently about India, and somebody in that documentary said about their life, it was an accident of birth. You can be born in a fortress or in a slum, but when you are born with privilege, you have the responsibility to lift others up. Lift others up. That's a whole other sermon right there, but... Um, but I believe that we also have a responsibility not just to lift others up, but to give thanks to God for that all the time. 
We were born into a fortress, not into a slum. And so we should lift him up in thanksgiving. So if you're scratching around for things to thank God for, start with that. Start with our fortunate lives. And the fact that we were born into this culture or had the ability to move into this culture is, is, is my case because that's not always easy. If people are born into the slums, they can't move. It's easy for us in this culture to say, well, why don't they just leave? They can't. They're not upwardly mobile. They don't have the ability to step out of those circumstances. So it's just too easy to find things to be grateful for, even in the worst of times. Because when we're in those valleys of life, we should still be praising and thanking God for all that we have. And I understand that that's the hardest time to do that. It really is. I mean, just the book of Job alone. The very beginning of Job, he talks about, it talks about all the bad stuff that happened to him. What's the first thing Job did was praise God and thank him. It's the hardest possible time, but it's critical to do it. If your business is failing and collapsing around your ears, thank God for your family. If your family packs up and leaves, thank God for your health. If your health begins to fail, then praise God for the people that stand around your bedside. And if there are none of those, then just praise God and thank Him for His faithfulness in your life and His presence in your life. If you want a biblical example of that, Psalm 57 is perfect. Again, this is David writing. And the context of this is that David had been a very powerful commander in the army of Saul. He'd been given all the power. He'd been given these armies. He had gained great respect in the culture at the time. He was a great warrior. In fact, people considered him to be a greater warrior than Saul. They seemed to have more respect for the king than the king himself. And Saul became jealous. And he set about to take David down. So David fled. But where was he going to go? He couldn't go to his wife because his wife was the daughter of Saul, so he'd be quickly found and killed. He couldn't go to Jonathan, his best friend, because Jonathan was the son of Saul, so he'd be quickly found and killed. He couldn't go to Samuel, the one that anointed him as king, the one that was his mentor because he was elderly. He was on the run. Samuel wasn't going to keep up with him. And so he fled to a cave, and he wrote Psalm 57. And it starts off by, have mercy on me, my God, have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. Desperation, but also realization. I've lost so much. I've lost my position. I've lost my power. I've lost my wife, my best friend, my mentor. But I've not lost the Lord God. He's hitting rock bottom here, but God is kind of cushioning the bottom of the pit. So even in his most def desperate moments, David writes, Be exalted, O God, about the heavens. Let your glory be all over the earth. I will praise you. I will sing of you among the people. For great is your love. Your faithfulness reaches the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. So even when he feels like there is nothing to be thankful for, there is so much to be thankful for. And this is why a prayer of thanksgiving to the Lord is important for us to pray. And if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know how to do that? You pray. A prayer. A prayer of surrender. Not complicated, just a prayer that says, Lord, I need you in my life. I give myself to you. I give my life to you. I repent of all the bad things that I've done. And I open myself up to the transformation that I know can happen in my life because of you. The transformation that you can bring about in me. But most of all, I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity to do that. I thank you for un unconditionally accepting me in my sin and loving me. Because at the end of the day, if every other word fails you, if you go down in prayer of thanksgiving and every other word fails you, all you have to say is thank you, Lord, for loving me. The last two parts of this series really are going to focus on the nuts and bolts of prayer. We're going to get into how we pray. How do we put together these prayers? How can we sound more eloquent when we pray? Not that we have to, but if that's what we need, if that's what will make us pray, pray out loud, then we'll be digging into that through Matthew 6 over the next couple of weeks. So let's pray now and show our thanks to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for for the life that you've provided for us. We thank you for the privilege that we get born into. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together and talk about you and to pray to you, to worship you and to study your word. 
We thank you for the conveniences of life that we have. And we thank you for the resources that are in this world that allow us to put together things that make our lives so much more comfortable and put together things that will allow us to further our existence here. And Lord, we just thank you for everything we see around the creation, the oceans, the mountains, the tiny things that we don't often notice, things that are going on around us that just happen and we just we don't even think about it anymore. We thank you for the fact that in our body there is constant healing going on. Healing of things we don't even know about half the time, but the ability for our body to heal itself that you have provided for us. We thank you for that. Lord, we just thank you for the creativity in our minds, the callings that we have, the ability uh, to, to use the skills that you give us, the ability to use the gifts that you give us. So Lord, we just pray for wisdom that we will maximize the way that we use them and, and thank you in in our actions, that what we do in your kingdom as your servants is an appropriate way to show our thanks to you. Lord, we love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to be in Matthew 6 today and 1 Kings 18, uh, and this is part three of our, our series on prayer, and this is part of our fourth key to unlock the life of discipleship and service that we've been talking about, this kind of overarching theme for the year that we've been looking at, this idea that focusing on discipleship this year will lay for us a solid foundation of knowledge, a solid foundation, or at least to get us into the process of discipleship during this year. And then once we have this solid foundation or or we are part of the process of building that foundation, then we can use this knowledge and commitment towards our walk in Christ to springboard us for the future. And then next year, as we approach the end of this year, we're going to be transitioning into a slightly different subject matter. So overall this year, we're looking at discipleship or unlocking those keys of discipleship and service. But as we get to the end of the year, we're going to transition into the new theme for next year, which will be the missional church. So we start off with discipleship. This ability for us to study and learn to be mentored by other people so that we can get this foundation and use that now to become a missional church or to continue to become a missional church. We already are, but this will be the focus for next year. For the first two parts of this series on prayer, we looked at this general introduction about prayer and we looked at some of the reasons we should find ourselves in conversation with the Lord. And we've been using this sort of letter P. P is for prayer, so we've been using the letter P for a variety of different words. And Pastor Carl, the first week, uh, used the word persistence. We should pray with persistence. Not repetitively, but we should pray with persistence. And last, last week we looked at the priority of prayer. The idea we should prioritize spending time with the Lord every single day because this is the most important thing that we will spend our time doing in any given day. And this idea that, yes, we should go to the Lord in times of need, that ability to to speak to Him when we really need something, when things are going badly in our lives, when we're walking through these valleys of life, we need to go to Him, we need that ability. It's this kind of break glass in emergency, we speak to the Lord. But also, on top of that, we talked about the fact that we should do this anyway, that we should have the daily conversation with God, not just when things are going all wrong. So the next P we looked at last week was privacy. And there are many times as faith leaders, whether it's a small group leaders, ministry leaders, church leaders, that we are to, to pray in public. We are to pray out loud so that everybody can pray with us, and that's, uh, that's great. But also we talked about the fact that it's not in those public prayers that we, we gain this intimacy with God. We gain the intimacy with God that He wants during these regular daily routine prayers that we do each morning or evening or whenever it is, but when we spend time with the Lord alone. And this week, we're going to look at the process of prayer. How do we actually pray? Or we're going to start to look at the process of prayer. And many of you last week confirmed to me what I'd said in the sermon, which is that it is an area that people struggle with. It's an area where, you know, in your faith where there's lots of stuff going on, no problem having like service opportunities, no problem serving God and His kingdom in that way. There's no problem with the Word, with studying the Bible, doing everything we need to do. But there's one area that people seem to struggle with a lot more, and that is the area of prayer. Whether it's the discipline of prayer, whether it's the process of prayer, or whether it's just, you know, remembering to spend time with God. 
And Jesus knew that this area was going to be a struggle for his disciples. He knew it was going to be a struggle for people across the ages and in turn a struggle for us because uh, this is what he, what he did was he included it as a direct instruction as part of his Sermon on the Mount. If you're not familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, this is uh, Matthew 5, 6, or 5, 6, and 7. And there's a lot of instructions that Jesus gives as part of the Sermon on the Mount. S.D. Gordon was a prolific author and evangelist from the early 1900s, and he wrote, the great people of the earth today are people who pray. And I don't mean people that talk about prayer, but I mean those who take the time to pray. They have not time. It must be taken from something else. The something else is important, very important and pressing, but still less important and less pressing than prayer itself. So he's reinforcing this idea of putting a priority on prayer, that we have other things to do, we have those some things to do in our life, and they're very important, and they're very pressing. But they're not more important, they're not more pressing than prayer. Prayer overshadows everything else because it is more important than anything else. So Jesus included this in part of his famous Sermon on the Mount. And it's really considered, the Sermon on the Mount is really considered to be the most famous of all of Jesus' teachings, because there's a lot of information in there. He was correcting a lot of the false teaching that was going on at the time, and what he was preaching as part of the Sermon on the Mount was considered to be radical. And it still is considered to be radical. In fact, we're kind of turning back in the direction of every single year what he's teaching on the Sermon on the Mount is becoming more and more radical, because even though what he teaches doesn't change, the, the Bible doesn't change. <laughs> I was going to say scripture, but I changed it just to see if you're awake. But the Bible doesn't change, so I <laughs> think. But what's changing is the culture that we're in, and we are now standing fast on what we believe is part of the scripture. <laughs> But the culture is moving further and further away from us, so it looks like what we are teaching now is radical compared to what is current in culture today. And every single year, it's getting more and more radical compared to what others are believing. And the amazing thing is, you know, these days, when we have Christian conferences, we have people that speak in, in huge churches, the, pre the preachers that preach in huge churches, they have no problem filling these buildings. It's not unusual for Christian speakers to fill a place, uh, a huge place, in order that they can speak. But think about back then. That's, it's easy to get to places now. But back then, people had to walk to places. And so at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, people walked. There were crowds of people there to go and see some sort of old preacher. Well, not old, but he was, he was young, but he was obscure in many ways. They went to see someone called Jesus of Nazareth. In John 1, Nathaniel says, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, apparently people felt that way. It is surprising because they walked in crowds to go and hear the Sermon on the Mount. It seems surprising until you realize that the Lord is in it. They saw something in Jesus that was different. Why did they come? Because he wasn't just an obscure teacher. We heard, we, we heard in Luke 4, it says, Then he went to Capernaum, the town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people, and they were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. They could feel that authority. They could feel something very different about him. And so they came to the hills where he was, and listen to him speak with the authority. And of course he was speaking with authority as the Son of God. But this is what drew people to him. And the first chapter of the Sermon on the Mount in verse 5, uh, Matthew 5, I'm sorry, Matthew 5, verse 1, says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. So he sat down. I'm standing here to preach today. And this is kind of the, different, the difference between, you know, if you sit... It tends to be an opportunity where you're going to sit and teach. In Bible study on Thursday morning, I sit to teach. On Wednesday night. <laughs> Sorry? Thank you. Yeah. Even I, I missed that one. Yeah. <laughs> so we sit to teach at those particular occasions because it's a much more intimate uh, sort of time of teaching and there's conversation that happens. But when we preach, we tend to stand. But now... Jesus is sitting because obviously he has a lot to teach them. So this is the posture that he's taking in order to do that. 
But here is what he taught about prayer, and we find this in Matthew 6, starting at verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners and to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what you have done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And that's where I'm going to stop. This is as far as we're going to get today. Because we covered a lot of the first section last week when we talked about the Pharisees, these sort of puffed up religious leaders. They made sure that everybody heard what they were praying. Everybody knew what they were praying and how they prayed for longer and longer and tried to outdo each other with their prayers. Uh, but they themselves weren't even following the laws that they were praying about. So it's questionable even whether they prayed in private. We hear them pray in public all the time in the synagogues and around there, but then did they pray in private themselves? There was doubt about that. Their prayers were filled with religious fervor. Their prayers were filled with historical scriptural quotes. And the crowd couldn't even discern whether this was something that they were passionate about themselves or whether it was just something that was an act. They were very good at praying in public. But did it mean that they, they acknowledged in their own lives what it is they were praying about? But Jesus said, don't worry. They've received their full reward. They've received their applause. They've received all of their accolades from people. They've received the respect from the people around them. But is that enough? Well, it was enough for them. So Jesus said, go in secret. Actually, he said, go to your room. As if you've upset him. Go to your room without any dinner. But he meant go in secret. Close the door behind you and pray to your Father. And this is the privacy side of prayer again. This intimacy of prayer that God wants from us, and this will be rewarded. These are the quiet prayers that we find ourselves bowing our heads and closing our eyes and just saying, Abba, Father. Albert Barnes's commentary said in this, that the second story of a Jewish house was traditionally a place of prayer. It was somewhere where people would go privately and the pious Jew would go there and pray to his father in that small room in the upper story of the house. In the New Testament, it was commonly referred to as the upper room or a place of secret prayer. And this is interesting given the fact that Jesus, for the Last Supper, when he got his disciples together, he used the upper room in order to have that final time with his disciples, when it's generally considered to be a room of prayer. The next thing that Jesus says here in Matthew 6, I love because it helps us to understand that yes, we should pray, but do not babble on like the pagans. More words don't necessarily mean more content. Think about the pagan prophets of Baal in this story with Elijah where they have this face-off on Mount Carmel. They chanted over and over again and still nothing happened. And then Elijah offers that one short prayer to the Lord and fire came down from heaven. So the lesson here is we shouldn't think that repeating something over and over again holds some magical value that if we say it enough times, then the Lord is finally going to listen to me. The Lord is finally going to hear it because he can't have heard it before because I've said it enough times, so I'm just going to say it again and again. So the lesson is that we shouldn't think that repeating ourselves is more valuable. The more we say it, it doesn't make it sound different to God. Ecclesiastes 5.2 says, Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven. You are on earth. Let your words be few. Quality, not quantity. And babbling never implies any kind of quality at all. We don't have to struggle to find the right words either. Just we've got to be real and we've got to be sincere, be respectful and speak to the Lord from the heart. There's a story of a family that was sitting around a dining table one evening and they're waiting for dad to get home from work. And he finally came in after a very long and unusually long day and a very busy day and a rough day. So he sat down at the table and he prayed and offered thanks for the food. As soon as he finished his prayer, he began to grumble and complain about how awful his day at work was and that his boss is a jerk and the rest of the workers are lazy. 
And then finally his wife brought the food, and since he had come in so late, what was supposed to be cold was warm, and what was supposed to be warm was cold. And then the, the main dish was overcooked, and it was dried out, the bread was hard, and he made sure that everybody knew his, that he was not satisfied with the way things were going with the dinner. So after hearing the complaints, his youngest daughter says to him, Daddy, do you think God heard you when you prayed a few minutes ago? Of course he did, sweetheart, he said. Then he said, do you think he heard everything you said after that? And he responded, well, of course, God hears everything. And then finally she asked, which one do you think he believed? Because genuine prayer comes from the heart. More than what we actually say, it comes from the heart. Our prayers need to be generated from the heart and not from the head. Verse 9, Jesus now says, this is how you should pray. And what should strike us about this is that it's an instruction from Jesus. It's very direct. There are many times in Scripture where Jesus does things, and the whole idea is that we model ourselves after what he is doing, his actions, rather than him saying, this is what you should do. Because, if, I mean, his life was perfect. He wants us to model that life entirely. So if he keeps having to say, okay, you need to do this, or you need to do this, and I'm about to do that, you need to do that, it would get a bit tedious. So, but he's very specific here about that this is an instruction on how to do something. The same thing he did when he washed the feet of the disciples at the end of that. He just said, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. A direct instruction to the disciples. And it's likely that he gave these direct instructions because these things are really important and he wants to make sure that no one misses them. I could be a little slow on the uptake sometimes, so I really appreciate in Scripture the times when Jesus gives us direct instructions and then I know, okay, this is exactly what we're supposed to be doing. There's no misunderstanding. There's no ignoring it. And he says, this is how you should pray. Notice he doesn't say, this is what you should pray. He says, this is how you should pray. Because if he just says, this is what you should pray, then we're just going to be saying the same thing over and over again. Because as he said, he said, that's what we need to pray. And so we're just going to pray it again and again and again. And what happens when you do that? Recite and repeat. Recite and repeat. Well, there are many churches that do that. There's denominations that do that. It doesn't end up being meaningful. It doesn't create this intimate relationship with the Lord that we're trying to establish. And I'm not trying to be difficult towards those churches, but what does it really achieve? Nothing. Nothing except that we learn these rote blessings and rote prayers that we just repeat over and over again. And after a while, they mean nothing to anybody. And they just become something that we say without thinking. And we've already talked about hollow words in prayer. And so Jesus launches into this prayer and he says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. It starts with our Father. These are critical words. Our Father, because this sets the tone. Jesus wants us to be personal with God. He wants us to realize that God is more than, wants more than anything to be in a relationship with us. And that's one of the things that God shows when he sent his son Jesus to the world. Jesus was in personal and intimate relationships with many people on earth. And that's how the Father wants to be with us. So the word Father puts it all in perspective. And when we approach the throne of God in prayer, we do so knowing that we are a child approaching our Father, a parent-type figure. And that makes the connection all the more special. It sets the tone for the prayer. It allows us to be in a posture of prayer that perhaps we wouldn't be otherwise. He's connecting in a very personal way. Then the next thing he says completes the whole picture. So he starts with our Father in heaven and then hallowed be your name. Hallowed means holy. It means honored. It means sacred. We acknowledge that it's God, not us, that is the holy one. It's God, not us, that is the powerful one through all his wisdom and power. And therefore we're declaring that we are his children and we will honor the name of God uh, in all that we do because we represent him in society. And I've got to dwell on this point for a while because this is really important. The first two lines of Jesus' prayer tells us who we are praying to. You probably think there's not much to dwell on there. We're praying to God. Yes, we are. We're praying to God. And I know I'm going to win prizes for stating the obvious, but yes, we're paying, praying to God, but is it really that obvious? Because we are praying to God. God Almighty. We are praying to an all-powerful God. 
The same God that Adam and Eve spoke to in the garden, that the same God that spoke to Moses through the burning bush and then separated the sea so that the Israelites could escape from death. It's the same God that stopped Abraham from sacrificing his son and provided another sacrifice for him. It's the same God that gave Joseph the ability to interpret dreams so that not only could he save himself, but he could be put in such a position that he could save the entire nation of Israel from the, from the famine. It's the same God that overcame death through his son, Jesus Christ. The very same God. It's not just some version of God. It's not the next generation down or generation, generation after that. It is the same God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And maybe it's just me, but man, when I think about that, I'm just blown away with that. I get to speak to God Almighty himself. And with that knowledge, we should think about how we approach him. With complete reverence, with complete respect, hallowed be your name. Holy are you, almighty and everlasting God. So now we know who we are praying to. What does that mean for us? Well, it gives us another P in this, in this sort of collection of P's that we have under this section of prayer. So far we have persistence, priority, privacy, process, and now we have power. We have in our mind that we're praying to an almighty and powerful God, so shouldn't we pray powerful prayers? We should, but we don't, generally. We have a tendency in our own human mind to limit God to what we think he should be able to do. We know what's reasonable in our minds. We know what should be possible. We pray according to these parameters that we have in our mind. We want to make sure that there's a high potential that the prayers that we're praying are going to be answered because we like it when our prayers get answered. So then we begin to get into the safe mode, this, this time where we make mental calculations, we go to the Lord and we outline all of this to God and, and then we wait and there it is, it happens and we go, praise God, he's answered our prayers. But how safe was that prayer? Every Sunday morning, I get ready for church. I get in the car and I drive to church and I pray on my way to church. I know it's only six minutes from my house, but those six minutes, the entire time, I'm praying to God about Sunday morning. I pray um, for the worship team. I pray for all those that are leading worship, that they can feel the Holy Spirit moving in them, and it becomes contagious to everybody around them. I pray for all the volunteers, the ushers that are here. I pray for the Sunday school teachers. I pray for the people in youth that are going to be teaching the teenagers. And I pray for the message. If I'm preaching, I just pray that I can be vaguely coherent. If somebody else is preaching, then I pray for them. But I don't just say, Lord, please help me get through the morning. Just help me get from now until about noon. That's a safe prayer. Because generally speaking, I'm probably going to make it from now until noon. Unless I say something very heretical in my sermon, then you'll take me outside and stone me in the parking lot. But generally speaking, I'm going to get from that time until noonish successfully. I'm still going to be around at the end of that. So that is a safe prayer. Unless I say, well, what I should say is, Lord, I want you to use me. I want the message that I say this morning to come from you and not from my own mind. Lord, I want you to reach people in deep down in a way that they've never been reached before and that the message speaks to them. And if they're going through particular challenges in their lives or they're going through dark times in their life, that they will understand that you are there for them and, you will, and they will understand that if they give themselves to you in a sacrificial way, if they provide their whole heart to you, that it will create in them complete transformation. The transformation that you promise us. Is it a reasonable prayer? It depends on your viewpoint. To some, it sounds like a lot. Oh, everything you prepared Sunday morning, you want all of that to happen from what, you've, what you're going to say on a Sunday morning? That seems unreasonable as an expectation. And if I wasn't leaning on the power of God, I would say that probably is pretty unreasonable. So I'm telling you now, in your Christian lives, be unreasonable. Be unreasonable. Not difficult. Be unreasonable in your prayer life. Because when you pray to the Lord with something un that sounds unreasonable to others, you're probably on the right track. 
And I'm guilty of doing the same thing too. I pray safe prayers. An example of that was three years ago, 2020, I started Trail Life. We started Trail Life here at this church, and I was praying a lot for Trail Life because I felt like it was really a push to start it in 2020. Because you need to pray a lot more in 2020 than most other years. But I was praying that we would get some boys here engaged in it. And if you're not sure what Trail Life is, Trail Life is a, a Christian scouting organization, and we have a troop here at the church that we started in 2020. But I was praying at that time we would have some boys that would be engaged in trail life, some boys that would be doing scouting activities based around Christ. I didn't put a number on how many boys I wanted to be here, but if someone had really pushed me, I probably would have dared to pray for maybe 20. 20 boys engaged. And based on what the kids we had, the number of kids we had in Sunday school at the time, that seemed like a stretch. And now we have 70. We have 70. But I thought... I would have thought that would be completely unreasonable. If I had prayed for 20, I would have thought, well, I mean, prayed for 70, I would have thought that would be completely unreasonable. And my troop master, David, would have thought this would be completely unreasonable as well. But the fact is that now we have Heritage Girls, which we started last year, and Trail Life Boys, and there are almost 120 kids engaged in scouting, Christian scouting, at this church on a regular basis. And that, if I prayed that three years ago, would have seemed completely unreasonable to me. So now I'm not going to be reasonable in my prayer life. I'll try and be reasonable in other areas, but (laughs) sometimes that's a challenge too. But I will be unreasonable in my prayer life. We started Sovereign Ministries recently, and we have started doing a food pantry down in Cowa in South Fresno. And over the last month, we've provided food to hundreds of people that are represented by 244 households that we now have registered. But you know what I'm praying for for this ministry? And I'm putting numbers on it. I'm praying that we will reach over a thousand people twice a month in Kawa. But on top of that, I'm also praying that we reach a thousand people in the, another community that really desperately needs the same, the same kind of services. But that's just a start. There are so many communities around the city that have the same needs. So I'm praying that we will have multiple mobile pantries that can reach thousands of others in other communities to reach some of their basic needs. Not only that, but I want to provide recovery programs every single week in every single community that we serve. I want to provide kids programs every single week in every single community that we serve. And when school comes, I want to be able to give them backpacks and clothes so they can start the school year right. I want to be able to give them hot food when they need it. So I'm not going to be safe in my prayers. I'm not going to limit the Lord to what we think we can do in those communities. Is it unreasonable? No, it's not unreasonable. Because we are praying to an all-powerful God who can move mountains if we have enough faith. And I have faith in an all-powerful God. And I won't put him behind some walls that are only the size of my own limited scope. What did Billy Graham pray for when he was young? What was his prayer like? When he was in the small evangelical college in Greenville, South Carolina, did he pray that he would bring 3.2 million people to Christ? Bob Jones, the evangelist whose whose name uh, college was named after, said to Graham when he was almost expelled, at best you could amount to being a poor country Baptist preacher somewhere out in the sticks. You have a voice that pulls, and God can use that voice of yours, and he can use it mightily. So Graham transferred to the Florida Bible Institute But if he had stood up in public at the Florida Bible Institute when he first got there and he had prayed a prayer that said, I pray that I'm going to influence over three million people and have them accept Christ into their life, people would have said, that's unreasonable. That's a stretch. That's overconfident. What kind of unreasonable prayer is that? But was it unreasonable? No, because it happened. He had true faith in the Lord that his voice would work in the lives of others. And God God honored that faith. James 5.16 says, The prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. Powerful and effective because the Lord God is powerful. We used the example of Elijah and the prophets of Baal earlier in the illustrations about repeating things over and over again, and it doesn't make any difference. Well, we can continue to use this story in 1 Kings 18. And if you're not familiar with this story, here's a quick thumbnail. Elijah challenged the many prophets of Baal to a duel. And what was the form of this duel? It was a sacrifice. 
They had to cut up a bull, put it on the sacrificial wood, but not light it. This was the challenge. Then they would pray to their gods and see what happens. So he said, pray to your god Baal to light the fires of the sacrifice. And they did. And in verse 26, in 1 Kings 18, it says, They called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. Then Elijah, and this is one of my favorite pieces of scripture. Elijah at that point then begins to make fun of them. Elijah's like, really? Verse 27, shout louder, he says. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling, or maybe he's fallen asleep and must be awakened. But they do. They get louder. They get more frantic. They begin cutting themselves that they're praying so hard. But uh, finally, Elijah steps up, and this is what he does. Elijah took 12 stones, verse 31. One for each of the tribes have descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built in an altar of the name of the Lord, he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seers of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, laid it on the wood, and then he said to them, this is important, fill four large jars with water and pour it onto the offering and onto the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he said, and they did it a third time, and the water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. And I've used this analogy before. I used it last year, but I just, I love this story and I love the way that Elijah does this. It's just, he's, he's like one of those magicians, uh, an escape artist who ties his hands together, okay, because he's not going to be able to light the wood himself. So his hands are tied together, but then he puts himself in a bag and locks it because that makes it just a little bit harder. So he's poured water on it. And then he hangs himself upside down with a rope just to make it even harder to get out of the bag and impress the audience. So they put more water on it. And then he sets fire to the rope just to make the result all the more powerful, to really demonstrate his power as a magician, as an escape artist, because if he can get out of a bag and get out of the ties and get out from the burning rope before it drops, then he really shows the power as a magician. And what Elijah's doing is here, he's magnifying the power of the Lord by making it even more difficult than it already is. Not difficult for God, but difficult from our perspective, from a worldly perspective. The others have failed, and now he's saying, watch this. And at this point, you know that in the crowd that's surrounding there, that there's a lot of people pretty skeptical about this. There's a lot of people that are thinking, well, this is unreasonable. There's no way. This is going to happen. It's not just trying to light the wood. He's dumped water on it. He's dumped more water on it. There's so much water, it's running off into the sides. And at this point, they are thinking, this is unreasonable. But he prayed to God. No crazy prayers, no cutting himself, no waving his arms around in the air. Just a simple prayer to God. In verse uh, 36, it says, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all the things you command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so that these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. And what did God do? Verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice. Not just the sacrifice. It burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up all the water in the trench. Unreasonable? Not anymore, because it happened. But Elijah had no hesitation with this challenge. He confidently steps up. And against all odds, from a worldly perspective, he called down the full power of the Lord in prayer in the most spectacular way because his faith drove him to put no limits on the Lord. Just to set fire to the wood would have been one thing because it was difficult to do in the first place. But the Lord God did so much more. And this is the Lord that we speak to. How can we say to him, Let's just get through the day. Let me just get through the morning. When what we should be saying is allowing us to be empowered with your Holy Spirit, to serve in your kingdom today and to be a beacon of what you can do in your kingdom through us. Because when we open ourselves up to him in that way, watch out, because he will use you in a mighty way. Jesus fed the 5,000. 
with five loaves of bread, two fish, and the disciples brought the food to Jesus. The disciples distributed the food to the people. The disciples picked up all the leftovers and brought them back to Jesus. But it wasn't them who had the power to make it happen. It was Jesus. And in the same way, God uses his power through us to do unreasonable things. We just have to get out of his way and let him. Because when we box him in, we aren't restricting him, we are restricting his ability to use us. Because the last part of the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal is the result of this show of power, in verse 39 it says, when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. What would have been considered to be an out, out, unreasonable outcome was exactly what Elijah had asked for in prayer. Because in prayer he said, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God. And they are saying, the Lord, he is God. The first line of the prayer that Jesus is teaching us sets the scene. This is your Father. It means that we are to have a close and a personal relationship with him. And this name should be hallowed or revered or honored. Why? Because he is the all-powerful God who is capable of doing anything that we ask him, even if it's completely unreasonable in everybody else's eyes, if it is his will. Because sometimes there may be times when we ask for him, and it may be unreasonable things, but it may not be quite the right time. It may not be something that we are called to do. But let him decide that. Present it to him anyway even the most outrageous and unreasonable expectations that you want to have. But if you're here today and you've never prayed to the Lord, maybe it's because you don't believe in God, and if that's the case, you're keeping yourself from the best thing that you could possibly have in your life. You're limiting your own life by depending on the world rather than depending on the Lord. Or maybe it's that you believe you just haven't found the words and be able to put together the prayer in your own mind, or you feel like that what you want to ask God for is unreasonable. But just start off by acknowledging who he is to you, who he is in your life. He is your father. And then understand who he is, that he's the same powerful God that we read about in Scripture constantly. And we can have a conversation with him any day. But most of all, once we realize who he is, then we shouldn't hold back in our prayer life. We are called to be bold. We are called to be unreasonable. There's a reason people that pray a lot are called prayer warriors. Are they praying safe prayers? Not generally. They shouldn't be. These are people that pray the sort of intercessory prayer that we talked about in the first week. The prayers when we pray on behalf of other people. And they are asking for things like healing. If someone is sick, they're just saying, heal these people. Sometimes it seems completely unreasonable to ask for healing for some people when they're in such a bad shape. And sometimes God's answer to that is to take those people back to him and heal them in eternal life. But God's answer is, God answers all of these prayers. I'm going to close with something that's like, it's more a business analogy. Does anybody know what a BHAG is? B-H-A-G, BHAG. It was started by Jim Collins. Jim Collins wrote a couple of books, Built to Last and Good to Great, and he came up with this concept of a BHAG. A BHAG literally stands for a big, hairy, audacious goal. A big, hairy, audacious goal. And Jim Collins wrote about this and he said, to stimulate progress, we encourage you to think beyond the traditional corporate statement and consider the powerful mechanism of a BHAG. BHAGs are bold and they fall in the gray area between uh, where reason and prudence says this is unreasonable. But the drive for progress says, we believe we can do it nonetheless. So these aren't just goals. They're big, hairy, audacious goals. Well, this is what prayer warriors should be praying. Any of us, we should be praying big, hairy, audacious prayers. Behaps. Why? Because what seems unreasonable or what seems audacious to us is not for an all-powerful Lord. So next week, we'll go further into the Lord's Prayer as taught by Jesus. But in the meantime, fire up some behaps, some big hairy, audacious prayers. Because the only restriction that we put on what the Lord can do is through the limitations that we have in our own minds. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your examples, for your instructions. And in this case, Jesus giving us direct instructions. And we're grateful for all that's written in the Sermon on the Mount, all of the 
detailed instructions on how we should live our Christian lives. So Lord, open our heart to see that prayer is a very important part of our Christian lives. So Lord, as we model ourselves on what Jesus did in his life, we must listen to what he said we should do in prayer. Lord, we're grateful for the examples in Scripture about how we can pray some big, hairy, audacious, audacious prayers. So Lord, help us to have an open mind, to understand that what is unreasonable to people here is not unreasonable to you, and that we should aim high, we should be bold in our Christian lives, and we should try to develop in the biggest way possible all the ministries that we put forward. Lord, we love you. We love your word. And we're grateful for all you give us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be in Matthew 6 uh, again today. Matthew 6. We'll continue, continue looking at the Lord's Prayer. We're also going to be in Matthew 18, if you'd like to bookmark different spots. But we're going to be primarily in Matthew 6. So the big question I have this week is, did you, have, did you pray any behaps this week? Behaps. And you're looking at me like I'm crazy. If you were here last week, we talked about behaps. B-H-A-P. Big, hairy, audacious prayers. <laughs> Big, hairy, audacious prayers. It comes from the business language of Jim Collins, who wrote Built to Last and Good to Great, the business books, where he came up with the concept of big, hairy, audacious goals. Well, we are going to be praying big, hairy, audacious prayers uh, today and every other day. So we want to get the, to this idea of behaps because prayers that sound audacious, prayers that sound unreasonable to other people, to the Lord, they're just a sign that we are trusting him and his power in our prayer life, and we know that he is bigger than the small box that we so often decide to put him in. We have to believe the possibility that these big prayers, these big audacious prayers are going to work, and that they will happen. We don't want to just pray them because, well, it couldn't hurt. I'll pray it anyway, see if it comes true. We pray these prayers because we believe that they're going to happen. There's a tale that's told about this small town that was, that was a, a dry town. For the longest time, it was a dry town. And then there was a local businessman that came there, and he decided he wanted to build a tavern. A group of Christians in the local church were very concerned about this, so they decided to put together a prayer vigil overnight to pray for God to intercede on this particular plan. Well, it wasn't long after that. That lightning struck the bar and it burned down. The owner of the bar sued the church. The owner of the bar said that the prayers of the congregation were responsible for the destruction of his business. But the church hired a lawyer and said, this is not our fault. And so the judge who was presiding over this after his initial review of the case said, no matter how this case comes out, one thing is clear. The tavern owner believes in prayer and the Christians do not. <laughs> so we have to believe the prayers that we give to God will come true. Mark 11:24 says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. So we've been working through this fourth key to unlock the, the life of discipleship and service that we've been focusing on this year. And as we close out this very critical subject of prayer today, with a, we're going to look at a much more functional view of prayer. What is it that we need to know in order to pray on a regular basis? What is the process? And we started looking through the Lord's Prayer last week, and we got through the first couple of lines. Uh, and really, the first couple of lines was to help us to understand uh, that, first of all, we are praying to our Father. And we said this, we're praying to God. And I said, well, it should be obvious, but it's not always obvious that we are praying to the almighty God. We are praying to our Father. So that, first of all, sets the tone that we have a much more personal posture that we have in prayer, as if we were approaching, uh, it's like a child approaching Father in requests and just praying to them. So in other, and then we added to that, and hallowed be his name. And this means that we approach him with reverence, we approach him with respect, but also the, the knowledge that through these prayers we are tapping into the most amazing source of power that we could ever understand, which we don't understand. It's more than we could possibly fathom. Scripture is covered with the examples of this power, and this is where this idea that comes in of doing these 
these sort of big, hairy, audacious prayers. We don't want to be safe in our prayers. He wants us to pray big, and he wants us to pray often. There's a story about uh, a philosopher that was in the, the court of Alexander the Great. He was a great philosopher, but he had very little money. He asked Alexander for financial help, and he was told that he could draw whatever amount of money that he needed out of the imperial treasury. So the man went to the treasurer and requested the equivalent of $50,000, and the treasurer refused and said, well, that amount of money, I've got to go check with Alexander himself. So he went to Alexander, and the ruler said, pay the money at once. The philosopher has done me a singular honor. By the largeness of his request, he shows that he has understood both my wealth and my generosity. So we need to understand the sheer size of the power and the grace of God and not hold back. Because we honor him in that way. When we pray those prayers, we're honoring him because we know that he can answer them. So that was just the first two lines of what we call the Lord's Prayer. Remembering that last week Jesus opened this up by saying, this is, what, uh, this is, this is how you should pray, not what you should pray. This is helping us with the method. It's not necessarily helping us with the content. The content should be much more personal, but it's helping us with the method of praying to the Lord. We don't have to be praying the same prayer over and over again, because that would have been, this is what I want you to pray. It would have been, this is what you need to do every single week. You need to pray this prayer or every single day. So we don't want to be praying the same prayer over and over again, because this does not develop the type of relationship that the Lord wants with us. So Matthew 6, starting in verse 9. It says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So this is an incredibly brief prayer, but it's very broad in scope. We talked about last week the fact that it, saying more doesn't necessarily mean you're saying anything with good quality. You can ramble on and ramble on like pagans, it was told. So that doesn't necessarily mean that we're saying anything good. Quality, not quantity. We talked about that. Uh, so Jesus didn't make this prayer very long. He said all he needed to say just in that brief moment. Because let me ask you this, have you ever been subjected to one of those marathon prayers? Those prayers where you just think to yourself, this is going on and on and on. The person will pray from Genesis to Revelation and not skip a beat. I don't know who holds the record for the longest prayer, but there's been times when I feel like I've witnessed that. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that a person shouldn't pray for long periods of time. Paul says we should pray without ceasing. What I am saying is that there are times when you feel drawn to that. It's usually when you're alone. Those are the times when you usually end up praying for long periods of time is when you're alone with the Lord. Public prayer tends not to be that sort of time period. But if you feel the desire or you feel moved by God to pray for long periods of time, then absolutely you should, especially when you're going through things that need a lot of connection with the Lord. God honors the prayers of, of people that pray to him with a sincere heart, no matter what the length is. But as we find in our text today, this very brief prayer has a lot of intense content to it. When the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray... He did it in about 30 seconds, but there was a lot of depth in that prayer. So let's break it down. We have covered the first section, verse 9. We did that uh, last week. And now here in verse 10, Jesus said, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this shows us that not only is the prayer God-based, because we established that last time, our Father in heaven, that is God-based prayer, but now it's kingdom-based. We understand now that this is kingdom-based as a prayer. When we pray this part of the, of the prayer, we're saying, Father, take control over my world and of my life. Because here's the great truth. Prayer will never be about asking God to do our will, but it's about bending to his will. Prayer is bringing ourselves into conformity with God's program, not our own program. Your kingdom come, your will be done. So we're asking at this point in prayer that God to be in control. We're asking him to have his way in this world. We're trying to set up our own kingdom all the time here. We do great jobs of setting up our own little kingdom. We make ourselves very comfortable. We make ourselves very successful. But it pales into comparison as to what God's kingdom can be for us. 
So this prayer asks God to act. It pleads with God to move towards the circumstances that will bring about his great rule over us as believers and his great rule over the unbelievers as well. It seeks the will of God. It hopes for the day that one day God is going to end war. He's going to bring good news to the poor. He's going to mend the brokenhearted. Declare freedom to those that are captive. Provide justice for all of those that are oppressed. Comfort everybody who's mourning. Create the new heaven and the new earth and gather together all the nations to worship him. And all of this is written as a prophecy in Isaiah 2, in Isaiah 60 and 66. So this part of the prayer, Jesus' prayer guides us through this world, a world where heaven and earth often can seem so far apart. Because right now, wars are still fought. The poor are still experiencing injustice. The brokenhearted still suffer. People are still captive to sin, to death, and to Satan. And the abusive social structures that allow sinful hearts to exploit others, communities are still mourning. People that God God has gathered together to worship him are relatively few in number. And we remind ourselves in this prayer that God is involved in this world. The prayer never asks God to do, or the prayer asks God to do exactly what it is that he already wants, and that's for him to be glorified in this world, the whole world to glorify him. Despite what we see around us, the Bible is also telling us, or the prayer is also telling us that it's written in the Bible what God's part in the world is. And it tells us that Jesus reigns. Matthew 28, 18. All authority in heaven in heaven and on earth have been given to me. All authority. So it's his reign in heaven and his reign on earth. This has been established and provided for us through his scripture. So the first part is making sure that we're in total submission to the Lord. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And this is acknowledgement of his greatness again. We've established that he has unfathomable power. And we've acknowledged that everything is his. Everything is his. None of this is actually ours. And if we're following the acrostic that we do sometimes in prayer, we talked a little bit about the acrostics where, or the prayer models where you use letters in order to help structure a prayer together. We said ACTS is one of them, A-C-T-S. We're still in the A, the adoration portion of that. Because what happens when we show him what we think of him in adoration is that it creates in us this ability to show reverence to him, the ability to show respect to him, and we take a stance of authority of adoration when we pray. Before we get too, too much further, I just want to talk about this idea of using acrostics and prayer models because uh, some people will say, well, they don't seem very genuine. They just seem like they're a little formulaic. That doesn't seem like a good way to pray, just following a formula in order to pray. Well, I can tell you it really does help people. This idea of of using one to create guidelines that we might not have in our own mind, the ability to start praying. We've got to sometimes get somewhere, so we use guidelines to do it. So these can be very useful to get going. So ACTS, A-C-T-S, stands for Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. But there are others. Personally, I like like the prayer model HEART, H-E-A-R-T, which stands for Honor God. This is the adoration part of it. Examine your life. And this is where we look at our lives and the sin in our lives and we say, Lord, we, we want forgiveness for this sin. Ask for help. And this is for ourselves in this case. So we need provision. So we ask him for provision. Request. This is when we do the intercessory side of prayer. We're requesting prayer for other people. We are lifting them up in prayer so the Lord can answer prayers for others. And then thanksgiving. We thank God for all that he does. And it's an, it becomes an acknowledgement that he provides and he creates And we are all the beneficiaries of that. But whichever one you use, the idea uh, that in your mind you can use these as a quick help to get to the next part of the prayer. Honor, examine, ask, request, and thanks. It really can be that simple. And as you work through the prayer, you have somewhere else to go next. Then you don't miss out something that you wanted to put in the prayer and you end up kicking yourself going, well, I said amen and now I've just remembered I needed to say a couple of other things. It's kind of like when you're writing an email, and frequently my Friday email that I send out to the church, which incidentally I forgot this week, but uh, it's been a busy week. But anyway, uh, usually I write it out, double check it, check it for spelling. I know occasionally that doesn't work, but and I click send, and then I instantly remember something I was supposed to put in it. It's almost like it's a trigger for remembering things. 
As soon as you click send, it's gone. I don't want to follow up with another email because I don't want to harass you. But, uh, so I just think, well, it's fine. I'll mention it on Sunday. But that usually happens. But you don't have to do that in prayer. You don't have to worry about it. Because when you say amen, it doesn't close the window and that's it. <laughs> P.S. <laughs> so if you, if you intended to include it, then it's okay. You don't have to wait for tomorrow's prayer. You don't have to wait for uh, weeks or whatever, however often it is that you pray. Certainly God does not have this time frame, this window that closes uh, when he's listening. You can pray all day, every day, and he will listen. So that was just a quick sidebar about those, those prayer models. Use them if it really helps to get prayer going in your life. But back to Matthew 6, verse 11. Jesus now continues with, Give us this day our daily bread. And here he's focusing on the needs that we have, our daily bread. He's the provider, therefore we bring to him the needs that we have in our lives. And obviously Jesus is not telling the disciples here that they should only pray for bread, although bread was a staple part of the Jewish diet for a very, very long time. But he's not saying just bread. But the bread, uh, the daily bread, is a reference also to the powerful symbol of God's provision for his people when they were in the wilderness in the Old Testament. Think about the story of Exodus. The Israelites had escaped from Egypt as slaves. They crossed the Red Sea. They're now in the wilderness, and they were getting unhappy. They were beginning to grumble a bit because they wanted some food. And they said, well, well, we should have stayed in captivity. It was so much better in captivity. At least we got some good food on a regular basis. But here we've run out. We have nothing to eat. And the Lord's response to that was that he sent manna daily. And this is in Exodus 16, where it says, when the dew was gone, Thin flakes of frost, like frost on the ground, appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some gathered little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who had gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. Then Moses said to them, no one is to keep any until morning. And then in verse 31, if you're interested in what it tastes like, it says, the people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Sounds great. But Moses had said, no one is to keep any until morning. Why? Because the next day God was going to provide again. So this was almost like this testing the faith of the Israelites not to store up bread. They had to have faith that when they went out the next morning that the Lord God was going to provide for them their daily bread. So there's imagery here in Scripture that illustrates God taking care of us. And nothing is better than using Psalm 23 for this idea of God providing for us. And Psalm 23 is really well known. It's probably the most memorized chapter in the Bible. But David really knows how to poetically write about the characteristics of God. And here the characteristic he writes about is that he is our provider. And so he paints this picture of how much God will take care of us. And many of you know this by heart, but the first half of it I'll read. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So he starts off this first verse with, I lack nothing. Why does he say that? I lack nothing because God provides everything. And then he makes us lie down in green pastures. As a shepherd, you would know that the sheep need the best nutrition they can get. So when they see a green pasture, they take advantage of that because the sheep need the best nutrition, and that is where they get the best grass and they get the best nutrition. But it also implies comfort, this idea of lying down in green pastures. It's a comfortable place to lie down. So food and comfort. And then he says, beside quiet waters. And again, in order to flock, for a flock to flourish... Sheep have to drink water as well, just like everything else. So when you see water, you take your sheep and your flock to that area they, so that they can drink. But also he adds this word in there, it's like quiet. He adds quiet. So now what he's doing, you're not just getting water, but you've got this image of lay, laying in the, in the lush green grass by a babbling brook. Food, comfort, something to drink, and now peace. 
peace. He refreshes my soul. He guides me. And when things get rough, when times in life get a little difficult and we're stuck in these valleys, then he comforts me and leads me through them. Psalm 23 is a masterpiece of imagery of God's provision for us. And so in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is just saying, ask for your daily bread, ask the Lord for the provisions in our lives, and the things that we need, and he will provide them for us. And then he moves on to repentance in verse 12. Forgive us our debts. This element is critical because forgiveness of sin is not just something we ask for when we give our lives to Christ. As Christians, we say when we give our lives to Christ, Lord, I am accepting uh, the, the, the pathway that you have for me. I am giving myself to you. I am going to transform my life. I'm turning away from sin. I repent of all the sin that I've had in my past. And that's kind of the process. That's part of the process is this repentance of our sin. But then it doesn't mean that after that you don't have to keep doing it. Because Christians sin. What a shocker. Christians sin. It is a shocker for some unbelievers because there seems to be sometimes a consensus amongst unbelievers that as Christians we feel like we're above all that. And then when we do something wrong, they jump all over it. Use it as an example of hypocrisy. So during our process of accepting Christ, we can submit ourselves to God, we can repent, and we can commit ourselves to this transformation that God wants, and we can, but we can never get rid of the sin nature during that process. And while we should be constantly striving to be a better follower of Christ, we still need grace and we still need forgiveness because we still do stuff wrong. Unfortunately, the Lord God offers us His grace, but we should ask for it. So in prayer, when we approach him knowing that there's always something that we need forgiveness for, we shouldn't try to hide it. We should bring it to God. Don't just ask for forgiveness for all these little infractions that have gone on since the last time you went to God and just all those little things in your mind was like, yeah, I thought a bad thought and this kind of stuff. But then ignore the big thing that's been weighing you down for the whole week. You've got to ask. He knows what it is. He knows what's on your mind. He wants you to confess it to him because when you do, you unload yourself in the process. You unburden yourself when you confess your sins. And now you can begin this process of turning back to him and you're not weighed down by it anymore. And you have to be specific. You can't hide anything from God. So whatever it is, he knows, but he wants you to bring it to him. Lay it all out there. Although if you go through every tiny infraction through, like if you haven't prayed for a week and then you start listing off all these things, you could be there for quite some time. You could do that, but there is an argument for a general sort of prayer of, of, of repentance at that point. But these big things, it's these big things that you know are holding you back from a relationship with God. You've got to let them go. You've got to put them out there so that he, uh, so that he can forgive you and you can move on and begin to heal your relationship with him. Be specific. Because sin separates us from God. And as long as we wallow in our sin or hold on to this guilt of our sin, then we can never truly be connected to God. And when we unload these verbally to God, we can release ourselves from the weight of it and start to reconnect and straighten our path. So this is an important component in our prayer life and not one to skip over just because you feel ashamed. And it is difficult. There's stuff that you don't even want to say out loud. You don't want to hear it because we're ashamed. Don't skip over it. Put it out there. And don't skip over it because you think to yourself, well, I haven't really done anything wrong today. But a pretty good day. <laughs> I think if you dig down deep, you'll find something. <laughs> because 1 John 1.8 says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But here's the deal with confession. You don't have to keep doing it. And this is one of the common things that you hear people doing. It's like, well, I just keep confessing this sin. It's like, no, you don't have to keep doing it. If we've done something wrong and we're just beating ourselves up over and over for a whole week about it, confess it to the Lord, ask for forgiveness. You don't have to bring it up every time you pray over the next 30 days. Just do it once and leave it there. God hears you. Saying it over and over to God many times is not going to change the outcome. The first time, it's fine. Just do it once. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive ourselves our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. It doesn't say if you confess your sin on the tenth time, then finally it'll stick. It just says 
if we confess our sins. So we will do it once. But sometimes we don't find the peace. And maybe that's why people do this over and over again. They keep repeating it because they're not finding the peace that they're looking for by confessing their sin to the Lord. But James has a solution to that. In James 5.16, he says, Therefore confess your sin to each other and pray for each other so you may be healed. And John Calvin once said that we are to confess our sins to God, but that confessing a particular sin to another person could be helpful, especially if having confessed to God, you are still struggling to find the peace in your heart about it. And this could be really hard, telling somebody else about our sins, especially if it's something that we're ashamed to even hear out loud. But telling it to somebody else is going to be challenging. And the important part of that is finding the right person to tell it to. Somebody that you intimately trust. Someone that you know will offer you the same kind of grace that the Lord will offer you. And someone who's not going to go blabbing it around and telling other people. Or even worse, using it against you later on. But then he says, once you do, you should pray for each other. So if someone tells you something in confession, you should pray for them. Pray for the peace that they need in their heart. Pray for them to have healing from the sin that has separated them from God. But speaking about this particular part uh, in the Lord's Prayer, when I was at boarding school, I was like eight years old, and we went to boarding school, and I had uh, a King James Bible at the time. So the translation in the King James Bible is like, forgive us our trespasses. And I remember having a, a conversation with a group of friends. We were all the same age, and we were, we were talking about this particular part of Scripture, and we were a little confused as to why God only needed us to confess trespassing, which in our mind was when you go on somebody else's land. It didn't seem like a really big crime or a big sin to us. So we're like, why does he just want us to confess trespassing? So we went round and round with this until finally we decided to ask the chaplain of the school, because it was an Anglican school, and we said, we said to the chaplain, why is it that God only wants us to confess trespassing? I would think that it would be something more than that. And so the chaplain had to explain to us that it's not. It's a little bit more encompassing than just going on other people's property. Because, you know, there's a lot of walking areas in England, so there's lots of signs everywhere that say no trespassing. So that was all we could get our minds um, around. But... And so here in the NIV it says, forgive us our debts. So you have to remember, this is not the latest government debt forgiveness program. Because <laughs> they seem to be coming out all the time. But anyway, this is much more broad than that. It's talking about our sins in general. Just thought I'd put that out there. But anyway. But there's a second half to this as well. So it says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And this is a, a critical part. We'll see why in a minute. But you have to forgin, forgive those people who sin against us as well. We have to be forgiving in that way. And much of Jesus' teaching is about forgiveness. So if we want to be disciples of Christ, we should also be forgiving people. How often should we forgive them? Well, Peter asked that question. Matthew 18, then Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother and my sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And that doesn't mean that you count out 77 times that somebody has sinned against you or done something against you, and then on the 78th time you go, ha, no. <laughs> I'm not going to forgive you this time because Jesus said 77 times and I'm done. Because in other versions, it also says 7 times 70. So what he's saying is just a very large number, the kind of number that you really shouldn't be keeping score. You shouldn't be tallying up how many times somebody has sinned against you. So Matthew 6 also has some additional information about this. So after the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, in verse 14, it says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, um, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's a really important part written in there. If you do not forgive other people's sins, your sins will not be forgiven. Matthew 18 has a great parable that, that speaks exactly to that. So Matthew 18, starting in verse 23, it says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle his accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him, and since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had to be sold to repay this debt. At, the, at this, the servant fell to his knees before him, saying, being patient with me, he begged, I will pay back everything. And the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. 
But when the servant went out, he found one of the fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, and he grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his fellow servant fell to his knees, and he begged him, be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison so that he could, until he could repay his debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged, and they went and told the master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in and said, You wicked servant, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have mercy on the fellow servant just as I had on you? And his anger, uh, in his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back what he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So it's pretty clear. What the Lord is saying here is forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors and that we will be forgiven to the extent that we forgive other people. We cannot ask the Lord for forgiveness and then hold grudges against other people. Be separated from other people in this, like, this bad blood, whether it's family or whatever it is. We must forgive others and so in return we will receive forgiveness because Jesus said, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So this concept of forgiveness is very important in our prayer lives. And then we go to verse 13 in Matthew 6. It says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And this here is a pure admission to the Lord that without him we are unable to model the perfect life that we should be trying to model in Christ. We cannot do it our own. If we have our own wits about us, we'll fall into temptation, we'll be snared by the evil one, and by acknowledging this in prayer, we're saying, Lord, we need you. Please work in my life and open my heart to, to your direction because on my, ho on my own, I'm pretty helpless against the power of the evil one, but I know that you can deliver me. We need the power of the Lord for this. Temptation is all around us all the time in different forms, in different vices, in different types of desires, and we can switch between all kinds of temptations throughout the whole day. Starting in the early morning when we decide whether we're going to take the extra donuts or not, that's the first temptation that we have in our day. And then throughout that, we work through different ones. Temptation to be dishonest. Temptation to lie to people in order to get what we went. The temptation to have too much alcohol, to take drugs. The temptation to view pornography or to cheat or to fall into a trap of laziness. The temptation to hide from the Lord, to pull away, to just fall away from our faith in favor of surrendering ourselves to our sin nature because it's so much easier to do that. That's our default. So yes, we need God. We cannot rely on our own strength to, res to resist the sophisticated methods of Satan. The evil one uses lots of methods to trap us in our own sin. 1 Peter 5.8 says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. This is a very active process, looking for someone to devour. And then the final part of the Lord's Prayer is, as we know it, as Protestants, says yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. It's not written in Scripture. Sometimes it's at a footnote. It's written as a footnote in some versions. But this is a really powerful conclusion to the prayer. Because it's saying, yours is the kingdom. Lord, you rule. You have sovereignty over everything. Yours is the power. Because, Lord, you can do anything through your incredible power. Anything that I pray for, if it's audacious or unreasonable, you still have the power to do it. And yours is the glory. Because, Lord, you get all the credit. I don't deserve the credit for what's going on. And so this process of prayer that's outlined in Matthew 6, directly from Jesus, we see that we should honor him, that we should examine our lives and our sin in our lives, that we should ask for a provision, the provisions that he offers us, request help for others, the intercessory prayer, and thank him for all that he provides for us. H-E-A-R-T, heart. And so we'll wrap up this subject, but it should really be in the front of our minds. This is not just part of another sermon series. This is a critical part of our Christian walk. This is a critical part of our discipleship training. We should see the words. They should go into our thoughts, into our hearts, but they don't just stay there. They become actions. Then we take action. 
Prayer is how we develop an infam- the intimate relationship with God that he so desperately wants from us. And if we find the time, despite many of the other things that vie for our attention every single day, because there is a lot of stuff that constantly is important and constantly we put in front of everything else because it's just urgent and it's on fire, we need to deal with it right now. Despite all those things, we still have to find time to pray because prayer is the most important thing that you can do in your day. Everything else you do pales in comparison to it. So out of all the different sides of prayer that we've looked at over the last four weeks, priority is the first one that we should work on. Priority is the one to start with. And we also have to understand that this intercessionary prayer is so critical. Praying for other people really does make a difference. So gather together the needs of others. Make it a regular part of your prayer life. Weekly we give you a list of people that need prayer here. Start with that. Sometimes it's just a list of names in the bulletin. You don't quite know what's going on in their lives, but you don't need to. God knows. Just pray for them anyway. Lift them up to the Lord as intercessionary prayer on their behalf. So just start there. There were five college students who were spending a Sunday in London, so they decided that they wanted to go hear C.H. Spurgeon preach. So while they were waiting for the doors to open, the students were greeted by a man who asked, Gentlemen, let me show you around. Would you like to see the heating plant of the church? The heating plant. Well, they were not particularly interested in seeing the heated plant of the church because it was a warm July day, but they didn't want to offend the strangers, so they just went along anyway. The young men were taken down a stairway into the basement, and a door was quietly opened, and their guide whispered to them, this is our heating plant. Surprised, the students saw 700 people bowed in prayer, asking for a blessing on the service that was soon to begin upstairs in the auditorium. So softly closing the door, the gentleman then introduced himself as Charles Spurgeon. Prayer makes a difference. Intercessionary prayer makes a huge difference to others. So find some time to be with the Lord. And if you've never used a prayer journal before, they can be useful for a couple of things. Prayer journals, you just write down all the prayer requests that you have or the prayers that you pray, and you put them in a journal, and then you do that every time you pray. First of all, it helps you to remember who it is you need to be praying for, all these intercessionary prayers, a list of people. It gets longer and longer, and sometimes people need to drop off it because they don't need any more. They just said that everything's fine, it's good, prayers are answered. Other times you're just adding to it constantly. But it helps you to remember who to pray for on a regular basis. But the second thing that it also does is that a year from now or two years from now or three years from now, you can look back and all the things you were praying for back then, say two years ago, and you can see how that played out. You can see the prayers that were answered by the Lord. You brought these prayers to the Lord, they were answered. And they may not look exactly what you asked for back two years ago, but there's probably better. There's probably a better outcome than you were ever expecting. In fact, it was probably more unreasonable than you ever dared to pray for. More audacious than we ever dared to pray for. And that will teach us to pray these audacious prayers in the process. But it's a useful thing. It helps to get a better picture of who we're praying for and what the outcome becomes. So I want to wrap this up with a quote from E. Stanley Jones. E. Stanley Jones says, Prayer is surrender. Surrender to the will of God and a cooperation with that will. If I throw out a boat hook from the boat and catch hold of the shore and pull, do I pull the shore to me or do I pull myself to the shore? Prayer is not pulling God to my will, but the aligning of my will to the will of God. Prayer is the aligning of my will to the will of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're just thankful for lessons from Jesus. He knew that we would struggle with this. The disciples were struggling with it. So Lord, we're just thankful that he brought this to our attention. Gave us a specific method of praying to you. Gave us instructions of not what to say because that's a personal thing between us, but how we should say it, how we should structure this. So Lord, help us in our prayer life. Help us to feel the Holy Spirit pulling us down onto our knees to pray to you at various times in the day, at various times in the week. Because, Lord, it's not just about breaking the glass and calling you when things are in an emergency. It's about daily prayer and developing a relationship with you. We're grateful you want that relationship with us. And we are grateful that we have the ability to talk to you and pray the things that to everybody else just seem unreasonable that seem audacious, but you see them as great work in your kingdom. Lord, we love you.
We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us today. We invite you to join us in person next week at any of our services, 8, 9.30 or 11, or join us online again at 9.30. New Hope is a church for the entire family. We have ministries for all ages. During our 9.30 and 11 o'clock services, our children's ministry welcomes all kids, infants through sixth grade, and our student ministry has its own engaging service at 11 o'clock specifically for your junior high and high school students. We'd love to get to know your entire family. You can find out more about New Hope and all the different events and classes that go on throughout the week on our website or on social media. If you have any questions about New Hope or would like to take the next step in your faith, reach out to us by phone or email or stop by the church office. Thank you again for being with us and hope to see you soon.